Yeah, we're still rolling. That's cool. Okay. They see me rolling. But <laughs> rolling and driving gets me riding to the Or white and nerdy. Or white and nerdy. Uh, that's the one. Yank of his Or white and nerdy. <laughs> God, that's really. That's, I think it's worse now. I think I made it worse. Oh, for fuck's sake. Right. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, good morning, and uh, welcome to the first episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast for 2022. So, uh, this was Happy New Year, everyone. Happy and New you, Year, man. Yeah, happy New Year to you and all. Yeah, thank you very much. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, mate. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm infused to be back. Yes. I really am. I mean, I enjoyed the yeah. break. Don't get me wrong. I, I think the break it. was good, but I think for me more so, it was probably a little too good because I, I had struggled getting into this and getting back into the routine of like, you know, researching, watching various things and yeah, making yeah. notes of stuff. I think I had too much of a break, <laughs> yeah, I think, that's fair as, uh, as it may, as it sort of turned out. But yeah, luckily I brought it back and got back on track. Yeah, but, man. Uh, yeah, no, it was a good, good break. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, yeah, jumping back in and... Uh, yeah, getting going, and we certainly uh, start off with a with a doozy, we don't do. we? Yeah. But um, for those that don't know, um, my, my name's Callum, and I'm one of your co-hosts. And as you've already heard, thankfully, is uh, is Scott back with me again? Indeed, indeed, I am. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> um, and uh, as uh, hopefully keen listeners will know, this is uh, the official start of season two season of the two, uh, podcast, which was a, a fairly recent um, decision mm. towards the end of uh, last year with, with where we'd been going with the various episodes and the, the subject matter. We were starting to sort of point in a, in a sort of in a direction um, that was similar enough that we could have just continued, but it's also, it takes us down a different path. So we yeah. thought have a, you know, fresh start kind of sign off season one and, you know, in, in 2021 and, uh, mm. yeah, start fresh uh, this year with, yeah. I, with I'd, season I'd two. I had no so. idea that we'd see out season one, let alone start season two. To I, be I didn't think we'd get to episode one. There <laughs> <laughs> was that point where it wasn't yeah. going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, never mind get to this point. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we're still, obviously, we're still very much enjoying it. And, yeah, thank you again to all you, you know, listeners for, um, you know, sticking with us because as much as we do it for our own enjoyment, you guys do help make it that little bit kind of more worthwhile. Um, Indeed. And some of the reactions we've had to some of the episodes has just been insane. Like the, the numbers that have just shot up over, you know, a matter of days. You know, we as we said before, we've we set a fairly modest target of, you know, I think fifty plays for each episode. Per episode. Yeah. Just just as something to kind of aim for. Um, you know, I know there are people like Mr. Rogan, who get millions, but you know, yeah. for us, fifty is enough for now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and some of our episodes hit that within days of of it dropping. Yeah, um, so thank you very much so, for yeah, listening. Thank you, we really uh, do appreciate it. Thank you very much, and uh, and whilst we're on the um, the thank yous, um, do our obligatory shout outs. Um, firstly, to our beloved patrons, James and Justin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do uh, you continue to support? as always? Yep, the, the continued support and. And the uh, the interactions as well, mm. the, the the points, the opinions, the questions that they that they pose, you know, certainly gets us talking and you know keeps us on uh, on our toes. So yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's of course not just the uh, you know the monetary support or, or contributions, no, no, but it's far more about the the other stuff and and just that you know there are people out there listening that are as you know just as into it as. Uh, as we are. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we're not alone. <laughs> um, but, you know, as always, remember um, to all the other listeners out there that you too can be a part of this uh, prestigious uh, supporters club. Prestigious, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. indeed. Yeah. And, uh, and you can uh, do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash cryptid ramblers podcast it's certainly very exclusive um, i've done about prestigious it's exclusive for sure <laughs> <laughs> and prestigious i'll go with it but yeah make of that what you will yeah <laughs> um we've got uh, at the moment we've got two you know reasonably priced tiers to choose from um priced at uh, four and six pounds respectively 
plus VAT. Plus VAT. Uh, we need to get that Do in you, there. Justin. Um, you'll get early access to each bi-weekly episode and a personal shout out, as uh, as you've already heard. Um, but if you're part of the higher tier, um, then you'll also see the video recording of um, each podcast. So uh, you'll get to hear our dulcet tones and also see our beautiful faces. Oh, so uh, right. if that's not... <laughs> you come back very... You did you get like a dictionary over Christmas or yeah, something? Yeah, swallowed a dictionary, yeah. <laughs> word of the day or something. Yeah, word of the day yeah. calendar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, word of the day toilet paper and something I swallowed happened it for... to you over the break. So, well, <laughs> you, you've extended your vocabulary. <laughs> well, coincidentally, I've got back into my writing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, go, the aspiring author in me has uh, oh, reared its ugly gotcha. head. So, you yeah, found those synonyms on... Uh, word isn't yeah that's what it is yeah yeah, yeah. i'll just right click and hit thesaurus <laughs> and then uh, i find most of my writing material you call it a thesaurus <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so uh yeah so if that's not if we haven't sold it already then uh I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, any any support is uh, is is very much welcome. Um, now, of course, we can't do shout outs without uh, you know mentioning the uh, the home of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast, where we where we are sitting right this minute, uh, the place where the magic happens. Our new purpose built studio here at Hellfire Studios it is based in South End in Essex, which is roughly forty five minutes from London, and it is the first podcast, film, and photography studio here in Essex. Hellfire Studio offers full content creation. So visit hellfirecreative.com for more info on all of that. Um, now, as always, for just being a listener of, of our podcast, you too can benefit from our sponsorship by receiving a 20% discount. Simply go to hellfirestudio.uk and use the code CRYPTID at the checkout um, and you'll benefit from uh, 20% a bit of money off. money off. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now we've got um, that's your VAT and your tax and all that right there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah more or less. Yeah, yeah. you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, now, uh, a, a sort of additional update from yeah, you know, I suppose the last couple that we've uh, that we've given. We are um, still ever closer to launching our new merch store. Yes, um, we've now got the designs, uh, what well, the first few designs anyway, over to uh, the guys over at uh, SOS. So um, hopefully. They are, they're getting mocked up onto, you know, the various items that will be uh, that will be uh, yeah, quite, making available. Quite excited about that, and, to be honest. Uh, yeah, yeah, looking forward to seeing how they uh, how they all look on actual hoodies and t shirts and everything else. So yeah, um, yeah we'll we'll share more on that as and when that it becomes available to us. But uh, yeah, it's something to look forward to as we're going to be working with another local company, and we've both seen and tested the quality of the not only the print but the the clothing and um yeah mm. we can certainly vouch for it and i'll, I'll definitely be making a, a purchase myself oh, yeah, of, definitely, uh, yeah. of one of them um as is my one <laughs> so, your uh, prerogative absolutely um so yeah we'll be working on some uh, additional designs um which i guess will count as season one merch um yeah i guess so, which yeah. we'll add in addition to the ones that we've already sent over to the guys so we'll, we'll have a a good sort of spread of designs and styles for for everyone so hopefully it will hit your fancy um right, that's all yeah. done so, yeah, so right, let's yeah, get so on. To get into the episode. So yeah. this was um, this was quite an interesting one for for us to get back into. It was really. It and, was. Uh, we decided that we was going to really look into like cave systems and and such, and, yes. and high strangeness surrounding them. And absolutely, yeah. Um, but we 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 came across a bit of a. Bit of a, a bump in the road, really, because what we was finding, <laughs> putting it politely, yeah, yeah I hit a brick wall. You hit a brick yeah, wall, <laughs> literally a brick. I couldn't, I couldn't sort of see past where I was. Um, yeah. it, I, I kind of liken it to writer's block. You sort of, you know where you are. Yeah, you know where you need to get to, but you just can't. You just can't get there. Well, the thing is, the reason why we decided to go into cave systems was because over the last year, the various different caves and things like that, especially since like Helia. Since we did our, our Helia so. deep yeah. dive, the idea of um, high strangeness happening within caves or around caves yeah. became quite a strong um, subject that we've been planning to look into. Yeah, got so quite thought, invested in it. Yeah, so we thought, right, okay, let's let's start going down that route. But all we kept coming across was just very dry, academic, 
uh, figure telling, like copying yeah. from a textbook sort of schooling. Pretty much just writing down what was on Wikipedia. Yeah. You know, this is the name of the cave. This is where it is. This is how big it is. This is when they found Some it. Some people have said this. This or many f- people died in it. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it, it was it was it was a struggle to you know kind of you know get through it and. Yeah, my, my research had sort of hit a bit of a brick wall and I was really sort of struggling. And like I say, it was coming out of that break mm. and getting back into something. You know, for me, in hindsight, it may have it may have been worth, you know, starting with, you know, something, um, you know, easier along the same lines as what we were doing in, you know, like last year. Mm. But, um, you know, as we discussed through the various episodes, we were, you know, finding this as more and more of a constant, you know, theme. And so it felt only right to, um, you know, to kick off, you know, with it, which is, again, why we decided to, you know, break the, the show up into um, seasons. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, as you say, it's, um, I, I mean, mine hit a brick wall anyway, so I couldn't, and we had, a, you know, a number of, you know, conversations as we yeah, normally we do did, about yeah, where it's about taken us and, and whatnot. yeah, kind of what we're finding. And, and yeah, and I was just finding the very kind of academic stuff, which, you know, which I know from previous episodes is kind of, you know, is what I have sort of tend to take on. Yeah. It's more of the sort of the academic kind of real world fact evidence driven. and fact driven kind yeah. of stuff. <laughs> But on this subject in particular, it was just very dry and very, very academic, well, more so than, you know, usual. And well, I was this just is, like, this, this is, isn't throwing up anything that I was kind of hoping for. This is the strange thing about caves is that actually the subject of caves is incredibly interesting, especially when yeah. like, you take into account cave paintings and drawings, how yeah. far back they've gone, what they actually depict in those drawings yeah. um, or paintings even. That, like, for instance, there was, um, I believe it was the... the, the the cave system that they found in Italy mm. that um, old Pablo Picasso went inside and looked yeah. at it and just went, yeah, we've learned nothing new with regards to art. Yes. Yeah. With, if anything, this surpasses us. Yeah. Like it's about the yeah. perspective that, that was from these paintings, the, the brush yeah. strokes that was used and everything, yeah. the colours. Uh, it was, when you take that into account, that is all really, really interesting, but it's it's difficult for us to put that into a, an audible medium for you guys. So yeah, it's one thing reading it and you know looking at the articles, you know watching the you know the various videos or, or you know, documentaries on it, but it, it's it's then trying to translate that into audio yeah, content so- that is interesting. And if I was struggling. You know, as as one of the hosts, to, <laughs> yeah. you know, to kind of get into it and and find the right you know thread to pull, then I know it was going to be a struggle for you know the listeners to get into yeah. it. There's no way we wanted to start off, you know, season two with a bit of a drab, you nah. know, hard going, you know, sort of episode. But luckily, your research took you down a slightly different route, didn't it? Took me down a rabbit hole, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see that a very big rabbit hole. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's really, really quite interesting. I mean, I've I've been looking at this particular sort of stuff for quite a number of years so if if I hadn't been I don't think I would have found this natural progression into this particular subject yeah um you kind and of knew the thread was already there. You just had to see where, just had where to, the research had to took you to it. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. And I, I, I sort of knew the sort of places that we needed to go into. And basically, guys, what we're going to go into, we're going to go into in the inner earth theory. Yeah. Which is so, something else, as you say, we both have been aware of, you know, more so from, you know, like sort of watching, you know, the Hellier documentaries and, mm. and in, you know, and other, other such, you know, sort of cryptids. But for me personally, I thought this was going to be a subject that we were going to be jumping into a little bit further down the line. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, maybe half a dozen episodes under our belts, kind of steering towards that sort of subject, and then having like a maybe one or you know two or two parts set mm. up for it. But um, but yeah, sometimes you can't ignore you know the research, and well, it, it naturally I mean, took is, us in. This is what I said to you, wasn't it? Right, that this is where the research has, has taken me with it, and I'm I'm following it. Um, yeah, and sometimes you just have to, don't you? You have yeah. to you find the rabbit hole, and you know it is one, but. You have to sometimes just fall down it and and see where you end up. Go tumbling down the rabbit hole yeah. like Alice. So. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. So for anyone that has never heard of the inner earth theory, um, many ancient cultures spoke about a world within the earth and even spoke about its inhabitants, mm. um, usually beings that are much much taller than us, which is a subject pretty that much we've previously giants, covered, yeah, which we've already done. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. As even the idea that the um, uh, the Patagonian giants were troglodytes, so they lived within caves, yeah, as well. So this was that again the redhead. Um, why we was going down this particular route? Yeah, the redhead giants. Were found, their, some of their remains were found in caves, Lovelock Cave in yeah, Nevada. That's it, Lovelock Cave. Yeah, that's the one. So uh, the first, first of all, there is a, a popular idea that 
many, if not all cave systems are in some way connected in a honeycomb-like structure underneath the surface. Yeah. Now, there's, there is some evidence to suggest that that could actually be the truth of it, and, and we'll discuss yeah, a bit of that on this, that, yeah. this, this episode. On. Like, for instance, there's a cave system in uh, Texas where yeah. they found um, uh, basically they're blind catfish and they only right. live in caves, yeah. but they only live in one cave system, and that's in Central America, or the southern part of Central America, Mexico. Yeah. So there's a potential that those two cave systems connected are connected through waterways or, or just underground streams yeah. and yeah waterways as you say yeah yeah so that idea is, is it's not even a new one either no um, many occult um, organisations and esoteric authors um, and even like secret societies agree with the myths and legends of subterranean inhabitants and and their kingdoms as yeah. well um, and it's they believe that they're remnants of an antediluvian civilization. Yeah. So when I say antediluvian, I mean like pre-flood. Mm. So it kind of sounds a bit biblical. Yeah. It does to an extent, yeah. But we know that there was a global flood around about eleven to 12,000 years ago. I think it was um, 11,600 years ago was yeah. the end of a, um, a time period that's called the Younger Dryas time period, which we've yeah. discussed before. We have. Yeah, we came um, up, yeah. And... We know that the sea levels rose 400 meters. Yeah. So any civilization that existed would have been on the coast of, of all these land masses and instantly would have been swallowed by the sea. Yeah. Um, I say instantly. It was something that happened over a, a hundred year period. Yeah. But so the Noah's Ark story relatively quick. essentially happened. Oh, yeah, but absolutely. It was far, yeah. But it yeah. wasn't as quick as depicted. No, it wasn't like it was book. like in the day and the night. Suddenly, yeah. well, that's what they say Suddenly about Atlantis like, well, as well. Yeah. Where Plato said about Atlantis that in a day, in a single day and night, Atlantis was swallowed by the sea. Yeah. Um, it's probably more likely that Atlantis, if it existed, yeah. was swallowed by the sea over a very quick amount of time. In comp- like, yeah. Um, a ge- like geographically of a, yeah. a, it, it would have been like 100 years or something yeah. like that but that's pretty quick yeah really <laughs> yeah. Um, in the grand scheme of things <clears throat> yeah exactly yeah so yeah the idea is that they they sought refuge in hollow caverns within the earth's surface um, now this is something don't get this the inner earth theory confused with hollow earth theory now a hollow earth is where it's like like a hollow easter egg mm. so there's like a land mass on the inside of the Earth's crust with a sun That's in the middle. That's what I was going to say, yeah. It's not to be confused with the hollow Earth yeah. theory. That yeah. one's a bit too out there. Yeah, yeah. The inner Earth one I could jump on board with. Yeah. Um, getting off the fence early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Spoiler alert. Uh, right, that's it. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just want like, people to understand that it's not hollow Earth theory. Yeah. It's inner Earth yeah. where there's like a hollow caverns in a honeycomb-like structure across the Earth's surface. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, some have been found. Yeah. So it, it is oh, true so to an extent. Cabins. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely huge cabins and yeah. obviously huge cave systems as well. Yeah, so, absolutely, yeah. And like, we have mentioned it before, the mammoth cave systems. And yes, we in have, particular, yeah. that came up with our Helios saga. It did, definitely, um, yeah. Now, the idea that something strange was happening came up because of all the stories with regards to the Kentucky goblins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I want to start a little bit with the, the Mammoth Cave system Yeah, and go into that. And again, guys, I'm not going to be too academic with it, but I'm going to give you some, <laughs> some figures. So the Mammoth Cave system is located in central Kentucky and covering well over 52,000 acres. So the Mammoth Cave was established as a national park in 1941 and a World Heritage Site in 1981. Now, it's got 400 miles of surveyed passageways. And they believe that there's more um, under there. So this by far makes this the longest known cave system in the world. Mm. Uh, so over twice of the second longest cave system in Mexico's Sac Ocatan underwater cave, which I believe that's the one where they had the blind catfish. Yeah. Um, archaeologists are constantly making new discoveries and additional connections within this cave system, adding several miles to the figure every single year. So they're still yeah, finding still more finding stuff, stuff in yeah. that cave system. And yeah. as we've suspected, it off, it, like, when we've been looking at the various different maps and such, that it seems like the Mammoth Cave System runs along 
the Appalachian Mountains as yes. well. Yeah. So, so there's no doubt there's going to be stuff in the Appalachians that are going to be entry points. Yeah, and we've spoken to about just cave. how old the Appalachian Mountains are as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, they're so much younger than the Rockies, which is a much more vast mountain range, but yeah. the Appalachians are old. Old, yeah. Like, there's, there's no fossils within the Appalachian Mountains. That's how old they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think that you could really understand that. Like, if yeah. it's got... It, they existed before bones existed. Yeah. That's like, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely incredible. Um, they, they often do like various different tours through there and there's the Echo River Tour, one of the, the cave's most famous attractions. Um, now, it takes visitors on a boat ride along the underwater river uh, underground river, underwater river. We're about. <laughs> That's clever. <laughs> <laughs> but the tour was, uh, it was actually discontinued in the early 1990s. Right. Um, there are rumours of deep passageways not accessible to tourists as well. Right. So again, this is the Stuff idea. they didn't want you to find. Mm, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about um, H.P. Lovecraft's short story, um, The Beast in the Cave. And it's it's set in Mammoth Cave as right. well. Okay. Um now, he finished the, third, the final draft in 1905 when he was only 14. Wow. So he was he was hot on it. He was on it from yeah. an early age, yeah. Um, and he published it in June of 1918 um, in an issue of the Amateur Press Journal, The Vagrant. Right. So the plot involves a man on a tour of Mammoth Cave who unfortunately gets separated from his guide and becomes lost. His torch finally expires, leaving him hopeless to find a way out in the pitch black. He then hears a strange sounding shuffling footsteps approaching him. Thinking that it potentially could be like a lost mountain lion, he desperately throws a, a stone at the source of the sound. The beast is hit and it then crumples to the floor. The guide eventually finds the protagonist and together they examine the fallen creature with the, the guide's torchlight. Now as the the creature utters its last breaths, revealing its face. They discover that it's a pale, deformed human who'd lived in the cave for years. Wow. So the eye, some throw then. So the eye... Down oh, yeah. him straight away. Whoosh. As if there's some rock well, or if you good thought hit. there's a lion, like a mountain lion, <laughs> yeah. stalking towards you, like, oh, you put some weight behind it, I'm you? giving yeah. it some of these. <laughs> yeah. You're having this one, so I'm right between the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is... Um, this is not a... Uh, a new concept that humans have lived within the earth as well and like several sets of Native American remains have been found within Mammoth Cave yeah many of these mummified remains indicate intentional pre-Columbian funerary practices so wow. well before Columbus got there mm. um, another fascinating discovery was the remains of cane torches as well used by Native Americans so they were going deep in they were they were going in with cane torches they were going into the system as far as they possibly could yeah um so if you couple that with the idea that potentially there could be civilizations that live within mm. the mammoth cave system itself yeah could there also be entrances to the inner world or the inner so other portions yeah is Absolutely. that just the the, the kind of the top layer, if you like, is mm. that just the the, the, the the outer the outer city or the outer you know I don't want to say realm, but do you know what I mean like the, the the outer sort of borders of yeah. what would be an inner no, you know civilization. Well, this is the again, this is an idea. Like I've said, it's not it's not a new idea, and especially among the Native American tribes. Mm. And the one that I want to talk about as well is the Hopi Indian mm. uh, tribe. That they say that their ancestors emerged from. The underworld is how they say it. So they came out of the earth. Now, this this in itself, the Hopi Indians maintain that their ancestors did not arrive from the north or by boat. No, so the north being the Bering Strait, yeah. coming over from Siberia, mm. down through Alaska, through Canada, into... Mm. Yeah, I've learned that from this North research. Yeah, yeah, the north is. Yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> the north. Wall and the, 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 the north. And the north. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've got something coming up about the north as well, haven't you? I haven't addressed, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so they say that they didn't come from the north, uh, nor by boat, but instead they actually climbed onto the surface from the underworld. The specific place of emergence of the Hopi legend lies deep inside the Grand Canyon. Right. So an enchanted opening from the mysterious recesses of the earth. Mm. 
Native American law states that the Grand Canyon was formed as a result of a great deluge. So yeah. Again, a huge flood. And there's some really, really interesting um, geological evidence that's mm. put forward by um, a geologist called Randall Carlson. Yeah. If you guys ever want to check out his... Um, he went on the Joe Rogan experience with um, Graham Hancock. That episode, he's done two actually, a pair of them together. And those two episodes are incredible because they put forward so much evidence yeah. to suggest that there was this huge flood of meltwater from um, a two mile thick glacier on the mm. North American continent. And it just, you can see it. Mm. You can see the satellite images of, of yeah. this great big flood just going right the way across the whole, yeah. the whole nation. So, um, yeah, so there was a result of a great deluge, which had drowned the previous third world. So, you, had, so you mean like there are weather changes without human interference? Mm. Oh, um, oh, yeah, I guess, oh, I, guess in, I am saying that. That's interesting, isn't it? I guess I am <laughs> saying that, yeah. Mm. Oh, controversial. Interesting. <laughs> I might also say Makes that there's ponder. more trees yeah. in the Northern Hemisphere than there was 100 years ago. Mm. Mm. Okay, makes you think, doesn't eh? it? Yeah. It really does. We'll save that for another day. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll get um, a little Swedish girl on the podcast and see what she has to say. Yeah, argue that one. Yeah. yeah. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you How steal my childhood? How dare you? <laughs> we love you. <ya. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the idea is that the that Hopi cosmology uh, specifies that this um, was the place where the Hopi emerged from a subterranean refuge after a flood that destroyed the third world. Yeah. Several inner world entry points are said to be located on their land within the Grand Canyon, one of which is honoured in a ceremony as the dwelling of an ancient parent race. So a sacred site is strictly off limits to all but the Hopi. Um, the law further claims that the Hopi were assisted by <laughs> insect ant people, yeah, I've heard um, about the ant people. Yeah. yeah, who live within the earth, within the caves and the caverns, and they were pale humanoids with thin limbs and slightly arched backs. Now, so basically, like me then, <laughs> pretty much pale yeah. skin, but thin arch limbs, back. arched arch back. back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. You're one of the ant people, aren't you? But this is—I um, I, I said this to you, didn't I? About. Um, about the etymology of the ant people. Yeah, um, that's right. Where that, that name necessarily comes from. And what's mm. a really, really interesting um, connection is that ant in Hopi le- language is anu. Yeah. And friends, for instance, um, in the uh, Hopi language is naki. Mm. And so if you've got like the ant friends or the ant people is anu naki. Oh, okay. which is really, yeah, yeah, yeah. really interesting um, because that's something that languages that are connected um, from like vast distances, mm. like from one side of the ocean to the other. Um, there's what's really, really interesting is ancient Mayan, or uh, I believe it was ancient Aztec. Right. So the Aztec language mm. um, is written phonetically. So when you write down the words, it's written in a phonetic way. I can't remember what the, the guy's name was. He wrote a book, Fred something. I will find it and yeah. I will put it on, on the socials. And he explored that um, there's a huge connection between um, the Aztec language and old high German. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> das gut. Das gut. Yeah, yeah really das gut. Schatzi. <laughs> but yeah, honestly, like, they, they, he's actually found that he said, like, if you actually take these words, like, mm. if you say it compared to how it's written, mm. it's phonetically old German. Right, okay. Which is really, really that interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the thing. All, it ties into other stuff that we've got it coming up. It does other much. things. Yeah, so he's, he's relevant. We're not just... Well, we're intentionally rambling. We are. We really are. <laughs> um, so now this is uh, the Smithsonian Institute yeah. may have discovered artifacts inside the massive cavern um, with intricate passageways and rooms, including tablets bearing hieroglyphics. Right. Um, but this is the thing with regards to the Smith- Smithsonian. It's There's a lot of um, people that are involved in archaeology that believe that the Smithsonian are covering up 
a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like there's a, a big I mean, there's got to be cover up across the board in oh, some. Yeah, museums. Yeah. If you think like you know natural history museums and places like the Smithsonian and the you know uh, I'm trying to think the other name of the place, but those types of museums and mm. institutions are showing you everything they have in their possession. It's like, come on. <laughs> yeah, they're not. They've got, no way. They've got vaults where they've got stuff that they don't want you to see yeah, that they've it's like found. Yeah, scene at the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark where you put it in a box and they, they there's a guy wheeling it away with yeah. a, a <laughs> whole yeah. warehouse full of yeah. wooden crates and everything. As, of stuff that's I guarantee been found. you there's something that, like that. that. That's real, where all yeah. these giant skeletons are gone. Yeah, exactly. It? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's like the vaults of the Vatican and stuff. It's all yeah. there. There's a reason why people aren't allowed down there. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, there was an article published in the Arizona Gazette in on the 5th of April, 1909, um, that said that the Grand Canyon was once home to a lost civilization consisting of people of gigantic proportions. So again, tying back to mm. our Giants episode. Yeah. It also mentions the discovery of an enormous underground citadel by an explorer named G.E. King, King, Kincaid. G.E. Kincaid. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Got there. <laughs> Who once came upon it whilst rafting on the Colorado River. Um, the entrance to the city was the end of a tunnel that allegedly stretched for almost a mile underground. So this was based off of that guy's... Um, exploration of this particular tunnel. Right. Um, there was a bit of a, an odd sort of cover up because, if I remember rightly, Kincaid suddenly disappeared after telling this story. And then all of a sudden, people were going there to find Kincaid's entrance, yes, as they called yeah. it, um, and they found nothing, supposedly. That is interesting. <laughs> mm. There's. Um, there's, yeah. there's a lot of stuff, lot of stuff like that though yeah. well I mean this, this is sort of hapless citizens or you know people, people like just you and I that just stumble across stuff by accident oh, um, yeah. because they tell people and then that escalates and there's like a whole media storm and then those people are never seen again or they just happen to go missing on their next hiking trip yeah exactly like they've, they've said something or something and, yeah and, exactly they've yeah. said something and suddenly they've disappeared or yeah. they, you know they've found something and let it go out into the into the zeitgeist and all of a sudden, yeah, they've just been disappeared or yeah. suicided, suicided, killed themselves, yeah. shot themselves on the back of the head twice and <laughs> put themselves in a suitcase and threw off a bridge. You know, yeah. that's, that's all. Pretty <laughs> much, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was depressed. He was depressed, yeah. <laughs> exactly. He did yeah. all of that with yeah. depression, the power of depression. The power, absolutely. Yeah, but so yeah. I also want to talk about the actual possibility of subterranean life. Yes. Um, now... This is an interesting fact to go off of our previous small rant with regards to yeah. climate change. <laughs> yeah. Surface trees and plants are responsible for less than one third of the Earth's oxygen. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Marine plants such as uh, phytoplankt phytoplankton, um, they constitute up to 75% of oxygen depending on the season. So it fluctuates. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's actually marine uh, plant life that actually produces oh, wow. the oxygen that we breathe today. So um, oxygen that is... That's a genuine surprise because yeah, well, it's, it's kind of thrown down your throat that, you know, the rainforests and all this that we have to protect make up the almost the all of the oxygen that we, yeah. you know, breathe. And if you lose the trees, you sort of essentially suffocate. But trust, I guess, the, trust, trust the science. science. Yeah, trust the science. Trust the science, yeah. science man. Don't, don't, guessing, don't question uh, it. Trust the science. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. I guess, yeah, but, I mean, you're still saying that and then I saw see in a minute going into, you know, more evidence of the subterranean stuff. Mm -hmm. It... That, that, that now makes sense. So it probably shouldn't be as much of a surprise. I know, right? But, but I, mean, it, I mean, anyone that did GCSE level science or, or high school science will know that oxygen is a byproduct of pho photosynthesis. Mm. Um, they thought that this was the only way that plants could produce oxygen um, until they, they until they just like discovered uh, thermal vents, and that completely changed the model of deep sea marine life so right, okay. the idea was that previous to them finding these deep sea thermal vents was that it was all just full of bottom feeders so something yeah. dies in the sea it floats down it just gets that's where the idea yeah. of bottom feeder comes from so they had no idea that there are now these huge thriving ecosystems mm. deep in the bottom of the of the ocean where the sun doesn't touch mm. but there's still plant life down there that's producing oxygen yeah without the use of photosynthesis yeah so 
further studies of these particular um, ecosystems, scientists found that life thrived in these environments and life forms grew to much larger than expected sizes. And at these deeper depths without any aid from the sun. So instead of them using photosynthesis, they've been using chemosynthesis. And it's oh. is you and then chemosynthesis is used where chemicals such as hydrogen sulfide allow these organizations to produce uh, orga- organizations. Orga- <laughs> organisms. I'm reading my notes here. <laughs> organisms. Organ- these organizations of creatures at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Yeah, right. <laughs> Big glasses on deer. Oh my goodness, mate. <laughs> Bad, can I have that coffee, please, mate? <laughs> yes, <it> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they, this chemo uh, synthesis is allowing um, plants to produce oxygen. And obviously, there oh, are okay. other creatures that feed off of these plants, and then there's creatures that feed off of those creatures. Yeah, it must creatures. be something like that, must be. Again, you've got to believe the science because, you know, they're, they're, even now they're finding. It wasn't it recently, I read an article where they've just found a, a new. Uh, a new species of like jellyfish or something that shouldn't be able to live as deep as it yeah. like is but it's basically completely like see-through but emits all these like colours but we only know that because we shine you know lights on it well, absolutely well, down in those depths it, it just it's just see-through no, well no this is the thing is in a lot of cases that's also something I want to talk about as well is um, bioluminescence so in these deep sea environments these creatures mm are producing light so oh, right. they might not and they, and they produce like especially um, in particular predators mm. they produce the light to attract yeah. prey so um, like for instance the anglerfish it has that little thing that comes out of its head yeah. a little light that blinks 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 and then wallop it yeah. has it as whatever comes up to, to have a go at it but so for thousands of, uh, of different species of life, yeah. the power and energy to thrive doesn't necessarily come from above, from right. the sun, but it, it comes from below, from within the earth itself. Right. So think about this. If all the trees were to be cut down, then we would still be able to breathe, and that's all thanks to but aquatic everyone would be life. Living, everyone would be living near the coast. <laughs> yeah. Well, we pretty much do anyway. Really? I suppose you're not a massive I mean, we're only 57 are, miles away from yeah. the sea yeah, suppose, where yeah. we are, at most, yeah. um, unless you go up. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so, for instance, algae is the biggest contributor to that. And yeah, okay, it's interesting. If you think about it as well, the Earth holds an incredible, incredibly large number of bodies of water just on the surface, mm. which... Like each literally teeming with biological active oxygen producing organisms that sustain life. So if that's on the surface and it's also right deep down at the ocean's bottom, mm. then we also know that there are subterranean lakes and rivers and they they all exist and that mm. ecosystems can thrive off of algae. So I'm talking about like shrimps and fish and other aquatic mm. life. Um, there's also another food source that doubles up as a light source and that's lichen okay. ever heard of lichen before L-I C-H-E-N only, only werewolves but I'm pretty sure yeah, you're not different talking lichen. about dogs living down there no, no well, maybe <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. maybe but lichen um, yeah. L-I-C-H-E-N right um, it's did you ever see that video that kept, that was circulating a little while ago about though it was basically blue lights on the shore at night and as people were walking through well, it the yeah, lights yeah, that yeah. is lichen uh, so it's right, bioluminescent okay. as well as being a food source um, now lichen itself it's what's called a composite organism which means that it's made up of algae and various fungi that work together to a mutual benefit right now, fungi has also been known to be bioluminescent because in certain environments where there's no um, like wind or anything like that, they have to rely upon um, uh, like a insect insemination rather than right, it being yeah. just taking the spores on, on through, the wind. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there has to be something that picks it up, eats it, or whatever, and then moves it to another place. So it has to stand out. So he uses bioluminescence in order to do that. Um, now, lichen itself, it comes in many sizes and colours and forms and often looks plant-like mm. um, and it often appears to be a moss, but it's it's not it's yep. not related to moss or plant because right. fungi isn't a plant either. Oh, right. Fungi is actually um, 
it's more it's more animal than really? plant because vegan's going to hate you for saying that. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> so, yeah. You're going to do it. Do it properly. Do it properly. <laughs> because uh, fungi actually produces carbon dioxide. Oh, right. Wow. It absorbs okay. oxygen and, and produces uh, carbon dioxide. Little mushroom farts. Yeah, so the <laughs> yeah, little mushroom farts. I think I've had a few of them <laughs> over the years. <laughs> well, no too. doubt. No doubt. <laughs> um, uh, lichen itself is actually often found uh, growing on rock. Um Okay. One of the ones that, that I know comes to mind because I was there recently was Stonehenge. So Stonehenge, um, the reason why you can't touch uh, the stones there is because there is a very rare lichen that's growing on mm. Stonehenge. And it's only growing in two places in the world, right. Stonehenge and a shore in Denmark. Okay. Which is quite interesting. It is interesting. But yeah. when you take into account the amount of Scandinavians that came over a thousand years ago, they probably just brought it with probably, them. They could have just yeah. brought it with them, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but they've also found lichens in Antarctica that are alive, but they're over 10,000 years old. Wow. So these things, they can... They can really live. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, they, they, they've been known to glow like bioluminescent mushrooms, but they're incredibly hardy. So they can live in the most... Mm. They can conditions in the yeah. roughest conditions possible. Yeah. So somewhere like Antarctica, where I mean, Can't peng- get any harsher, really. penguin struggle there. You know, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> so like it's, it's if if lichens can live for that long in an environment mm. such as that, then surely they're able to live in within, ideal conditions. How long would they last for? Exactly, yeah, yeah. especially sense, within yeah. uh, the cavern that's within the earth or something mm. like that. Um, and it's lichen itself is, is often served as a delicacy um, in Scandinavian restaurants as well. Oh, right. Which I always wow. thought was, was so really a food quite source interesting. And an oxygen source. Absolutely, yeah. Wow, okay. So there was um, I, the idea that there could actually be thriving ecosystems within the Earth's crust, mm. or within the Earth's surface in this honeycomb like yeah. maze, mm. is perfectly plausible. But the, yeah. I suppose the idea comes, could it actually house a civilization of, of humans? I suppose that is the real... Yeah. I mean, I guess if you believe, you know, the theory, then I guess you'd be going down the road of saying, well, it already, it already does. Mm. A form of humanoid sort of being, not, you know, sort of humans as we know necessarily, but it would be a type of, through, you know, evolution or whatever, mm. Um that they've obviously adapted to. They might have adapted that way, kind of or living down there. Yeah, and yeah. some obviously came to the surface, and you know that's where the various Native American mm. um, tribes and uh, the Aboriginal only, tribes and stuff. The only thing that's to probably have, a bit more diff- that makes it a bit more difficult to, to believe it is that there's they had no idea of timekeeping, um, which. <laughs> Yeah. Which, to be honest, you can understand that because really, we've. If you do look at the idea of how we look at time yeah. and, and such, and and that we know that it's from past all the way up to mm. the present in in a linear fashion. Yeah. There's some people. There's some scholars that have said that that really only came about mm. when the church started having power and started basically deleting. Yeah. Previous works. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So even down to like our literary language, our literary English, mm. that is really only the forefather of that is Francis Bacon, who is believed to have been the real William Shakespeare. Oh right, okay. yeah. Well, Francis Bacon uh, translated. I don't know. No, he didn't translate it. Sorry, he wrote it. There was a translation into spoken English, and he turned it from spoken English into literary ling- English um, of the King James Bible. Oh right. So okay. and there's a lot of esoteric <laughs> symbology and stuff I'm because sure. he yeah. was he was a, a, a Freemason. Freemason, yeah. Um, Bloody Masons again. No, they get about them, they? <laughs> yeah. they get they definitely get about. <laughs> but he um he supposedly put a lot of allegory, a lot of symbology into the King James Bible, mm. which then pushed out a lot of other older things. So for instance, the Book of Enoch. Which we've spoken about before, yeah, which comes up in this. Which, yes, yes, it does. It does. Okay, it does yeah. yeah, but um, Sumerian as well. Yeah. So the idea was that potentially languages, even spoken languages, <coughs> didn't really have a linear sort of fashion, right? But they were cyclical, and that which 
I remember talking about that film Arrival with those aliens that yeah. came down, they spoke in a cyclical fashion or they, yeah. their, their literary language was cyclical. Then they experienced time completely different to how we do now. Yeah. So if they weren't any timekeeping, then maybe that's why. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin with trying to theorise that. But, you know, if you also believe that, you know, we're not alone in the universe, then, you know, not every planet would have a sun. Where do they get their light source from? How would yeah. they then use things like sundials back in the day to, you know, tell the time? Mm. I'm guessing the subterranean well, folks would probably use the running water or... Isn't it in Gears of War they, um, they use, uh, they call it emulsion... And Motion, it's basically yeah. magma that they use as a power source. Mag- yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the lambent are the uh, the creatures that, That's right, yeah. that live sort of within it. But yeah, it's basically emulsion, basically like, like a, a type of um, fluorescent lava. Yeah. Basically, they use as a life source um, to yeah, power so everything. Yeah. Rather than it so, being from a sun. And if they're that, if they're that deep... In the in the earth, I know it's fictional and all that. But then, well, no, yeah. but I mean it, it, it's, it's it has some kind there. of yeah. The, the science has to come from somewhere, I guess. However mm. far you stretch it, and you know, kind of elaborate on it, you know, to make it work for fiction um, or non-fiction. Yeah, it's um, it's got to come from somewhere, I guess. And yeah, I suppose mm. if they're that deep or they're, they're deep enough in the earth, then that they probably are sort of hitting springs or certainly even thermal lava vents itself that, and they yeah. use that to well that's that, kind that, of um, the, the thermal vents certainly exist within the earth's crust as well because there's yeah. that huge cave in Mexico the, the crystal mm. cave yeah with those massive mm. crystals that have I mean it hits I believe it was 175 Fahrenheit I can't remember what it equates to in in Celsius, but it's fucking hot at the very least. (laughs) A bit toasty. Yeah. 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 A bit bit warm down here, boys. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, so, like, we know that those sort of things exist as well. Yes. So Yeah, we do, yeah. And especially if there's freshwater springs, we're within the Earth's surface. Yes, absolutely, yeah. these ecosystems definitely can thrive. They Um, definitely can, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's definitely... there was um, there was something that you spoke to me about mm. that I was quite interested to hear a little bit more about, and that was the Schlaraffen Land map. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so Schlaraffen Land. Schlaraffen Land. Schlaraffen Land. Schlaraffen Land. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Oh, good, it just yeah. Um, I've been trying to practice saying that, and I'm still probably getting it wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, Schlaraffen Land um, is basically it's German, if you hadn't guessed. Oh, <clears throat> um, and. I mean, well, I've, I've sort of, basically in terms of how I've done my notes, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit. But okay. um, in terms of these, you know, kind of, you know, either mythical places or subterranean cities, you know, this this is basically the German version. Mm. So, you know, um, oh, I've got hair in my mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you're talking about, um, you know, Shangri-La, El Dorado, and the like um, that are believed to exist, mm. then Schlaraffen Land is one of them. Yeah, it's one of those other it's legends. It's just the it? German sort of version, basically. The, the, the translation is basically the land of milk and honey. Um, they, they believe that the rivers flow with, you know, with with honey and milk sort of rains from the sky. Right, basically. Gotcha. Um, in French, the it's, Willy Wonka uh, factory. Yeah, basically, yeah, more or less. Yeah, that's where it gets a bit <laughs> fantastical. Um, and in French, it's uh, known as cocaine, which means the land of plenty. Um, and it's the same place, but that's just the French word for it. It's um, it, it's mostly kind of mythical, but there are a lot of um, a lot of ties to places like Shangri-La, um, El Dorado, um, and Hyperborea, mm. which is one that you put me on the, the sort of path yeah. of, which I'll also go on to in a bit more detail, you know, in a minute. But um, yeah, it's, it's basically, it's just another um, another sort of utopia, another, uh, th- this is kind of less subterranean and more of a, a sort of an island, um, which is believed to be kind of north of where, France is now. Well, hi- what, Hyperborea or Schlaraffen Land? Uh, Hyperborea, Hyperborea, yeah. Hyperborea, yeah. yeah. Um, Schlaraffen Land is, um, uh, or cocaine, wh- wh- whichever you want to call it. Um, f- there's a lot of arguments as to where they believe the, where, the, where it is, hmm. basically. And I couldn't really find anything that would kind of 
where anyone would sort of say, right, yeah, this is where we think it is because this is what we've found or yeah, kind this, of anything like that. This it, was the, with the Shrill Off and then the, the stuff that I that I found out about with it was that it was within the earth. So it wasn't right. necessarily a land upon the surface, but it was a subterranean kingdom that right. had its had its place somewhere. somewhere. There was an entrance yeah. to yeah, Sharaf and land yeah. somewhere. But there was, so there's a like a lot of these subterranean um, sort of cities or you know communities civilizations whatever there's always a surface entrance or a, a surface element you know sort of to it mm. um, and yeah and this is like I say this is this is very much kind of one of them but yeah it's basically just a, a utopia it's a, a, you know an underground paradise mm. which he, and the inhabitants are blessed with you know extreme luxury um, you know peace you know they're protected from you know like a lot of the others which is why I'm yeah, probably going to rehash exactly. a lot of the information but you know that they're not um, you know they're not uh, sort of affected by you know things like war and yeah, like adverse all this, weather all the and crap that goes on on the surface all the stuff that we sort of get stuff. battered with yeah they're sort of blissfully unaware of it basically and yeah. so they live a very different kind of lifestyle you know they're all very kind of loving to one another it's like the city of zion yeah, exactly yeah. yeah pretty much that, that sort yeah, of thing really pretty much that it's a it's a it's a utopia that <laughs> for me out of everything else that we'll go through for me this is the one thing that i think is probably more on the mythical mm. only because I, I found a I did find an article um, that was kind of talking about its uh, its existence uh, or believed existence and they in I mean I'll, I'll paraphrase I won't obviously go through everything that I found but in, in a nutshell they were basically saying that that Schlaraffen land was kind of created by sort of German peasants people living in poverty as right. a way to escape the world they were actually living in so they okay, yeah. so they would dream of themselves living in this land where milk would rain from the sky and, and honey was in you know flowing through the streams mm. and i think the other thing was that roasted pigs would be running around the you know the the, <laughs> the grass it's a very very fantastic so, yeah, it's a very fantastic already yeah. roasted pigs exactly yeah, take a chunk off, out of them it started off relatively believable when you sort of started but when you read these other articles it did start to go more into the 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 sort of the, the mythical and, and someone did land on the fact that they believed it kind of stemmed from a time where you know there was a lot of sort of poverty and you know a lot of people sort of living as what we would now know as sort of peasants yeah. in in Germany presumably um, and so this was created as a way for them to kind of escape their reality and to yeah like I say imagine okay. themselves living in a you know this kind of fantastic to hope world. for that sort yeah, of thing but then there are you know those that want to look into it and will kind of say that you know actually this was a subterranean you know city much along the same ilk as places like Shangri-La and mm. El Dorado but what was quite interesting was there was the a others. map that emerged there is a, a map. supposed map that, that emerged of Sharofenland there is and yeah. I can't remember who it basically it landed on the, the doorstep mm. of, a, of a German cartographer yeah um, and he then I can't remember what his name was now, um, but he then translated or, or copied yeah. said ancient map mm. and got it out out there again. Um, yeah. Again, apparently he was again one of these people that disappeared. Yeah. So yeah, because I couldn't. It's interesting. Yeah, of everything that I found, which was seemingly the more kind of fantastical stuff, mm. I didn't find anything on that about its origins and, and where the, the map actually came from. It's almost like it oh, just okay. popped. Like, like just, and then it just appeared, and, yeah. and people was like, "Oh, yeah, well, that's where Sharaf and well, this is." The thing and with regards like- to ancient maps as well was there was um, the the Piri Reis map. Uh, Piri yeah. Reis was, um, I think, he was a, a, a Persian cartographer, right? Um, and he compiled a map that, and we've only got fragments of it. Now, this this map was huge. Mm. I mean, it would cover a wall, and it was all of the known world. So the whole known world that had been surveyed and been mapped, and on this fragment that's left over, you can see the uh, east coast of South America mm. going all the way down. You can also see parts of the west coast of Africa yeah. going down. And then right across the bottom, you've got the land. So this, bearing in mind, this map was produced in the 1500s. Mm. And we didn't find Antarctica until the 1800s. Mm. So this now had, this, this map details the land mass mm. that is Antarctica, Antarctica without does, yeah. the ice. Yeah. Yeah, it's all green. 
yeah. lush without the ice. And it's, but it's a, it's a smaller landmass than what's noted on the on the maps. But the fact that it's noted without any ice, yeah. at and this all, is like yeah. it's accurate as mm. well. This yeah. is how accurate. I mean, I think. I mean, you should check it out. The Piri Reese map. Mm. And you will it would you will see just how accurate it is compared to satellite imagery of the land mass. So not the yeah. ice, mm. but the land mass of Antarctica. And we yeah. didn't the Western culture didn't discover it until the eighteen hundreds. No. But this map, this Peary Reese map, he said that he copied it from older map sources. An older map, yeah, that he translated or whatever, yeah. yeah. So when did they find Antarctica? How the hell did they find it? Well, it would have been easier to sort of navigate because it wouldn't have been bloody snow and ice. Exactly. It would have been like lush, <laughs> green, depending on green where it was. And forests and woodland. And yeah, absolutely. Depending so, on how far back, you know, you sort of, you want to go. So, mm. But the, yeah. what we found quite interesting was that um, there are rumours that the entrance mm. to Sharovan land... Mm. Is to the north. It that's is. That's what I found it is quite interesting. Yeah, that's what they. Yeah, I mean that's that that reference there kind of ties in a lot of a lot of it and a lot of what we'll go over. Mm. Yeah, kind of in a second. But whilst we're sort of on the mystical, I found something that I'm not sure you found, but I, okay. it harkens back to a previous episode. So I think you might enjoy it. Yeah, go for it. Because um, I thought I'd start a bit light-hearted with the kind of stuff that I found that was more mystical. You, you know, we don't want to jump in. Two footed to any yeah. theory and be like, yeah, we believe it. Blah, blah. You know, <laughs> no, it's if we find the stuff that is, um, to coin a phrase, utter nonsense, utter nonsense, then uh, I do like to bring it to everyone, <laughs> especially if it makes me laugh. So, yeah, Sharafan yeah, Land is one of the more mystical, um, sort of subterranean uh, locations. And another one uh, I found in Celtic lore um, there is a cave called Rathcoggan, um, which is also known as Island's Gate to Hell. Yeah, I have heard of this. And yeah. uh, according to legend, strange creatures would emerge uh, and were then seen on the surface of the earth. Um, there are also stories of knights and saints venturing into said cave on Station Island in County Donegal, where they made their journeys inside the earth um, and then were forever in a state of purgatory. Was this the one where they built a fortress around the, the entrance? I didn't no, deep dive into that the actual one, That one was entrance, actually mainland main Europe. I can't remember what it was. I think it was something like Slovenia or, or something like right, that. Okay. There was a similar sort of story that comes out of that, that area mm. in which they built um, a fortress around the hole. Right, okay. Basically. To stop people to going stop in, in it, probably. No, to stop <laughs> things from coming out. Oh, coming out. Yeah. Oh, shit, right. Almost, okay. like a, almost like a night's watch sort of thing. Right, okay. Like, yeah, well, that, I mean, it makes sense just going by, you know, this story. So, yes, these saints and knights would go in um, to the into the earth, and either that either they wouldn't come out, or if they did, they were in this like yeah, what was known as a state of purgatory, which is kind of like a between sort of a between life and death. So what, type when they came stance. out, they were just like yeah, they were just like kind shell of shell shock. Yeah, yeah, melancholy. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. Um, now in County Down. Not uh, a little bit of Irish way, oh, Northern, yeah, Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Um, there is a belief that says that uh, there are tunnels that lead um, to the land of Tuatha Du Danann. Ah, the Tuatha Danann. Yeah. You got you got to pronounce it right. Tuatha Du Danann. Tuatha Danann. Tuatha Danann. That's, that's how the, they pronounce it. You got the dirt, I know, but that's how they pronounce it. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. So you just ignore the dirt. Yeah. Bit. All right. Yeah, okay. Forget the dirt. Right. The okay. Danan. Fine. We just always have to ruin it. Don't yeah, we? sorry, guys. It's always that quality content. Quality content as always. Um, Seal of approval. But yeah, but um, yeah, the reason reason why I thought you would like that is because you know, as you know. Um, we covered um, we covered them in our fairy episode. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So they believe that in County Down there is a system of tunnels that lead from the surface of the earth down into the the land that is occupied by the uh, the Irish fairies. Excellent. The That's Tuatha cool. Danann. The Tuatha Danann. Danann and Arnon. I can't say it seriously now. You ruined it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I don't know what point to mention this, but it was just kind of a throwaway sort of fact that I found. So I thought I'd mention it now. Yeah, go on, go for it. Um, but the Aurora 
Borealis, mm-hmm. or the Northern Lights, yep. um, is uh, is believed to basically be gases that are emitted from the inner Earth, which is why the colours are so vivid. Yes, mm. because it's yeah, it, it's um, yeah, it, it's it's gases that are emitted from mm. the Earth's kind of inner. So it's core. like a natural process that the Earth and goes then when through. it hits the atmosphere above us, mm. that's what then. You know, sort of, it become ionized and the, it yeah. creates the globe, creates the northern lights as mm. we as we know it. But it could actually be an effect of well, inner Earth. This is something that has been um, observed on other planets as well. So, uh, in particular, uh, Saturn. Now, what's right. really really interesting about Saturn is it has a hexagonal storm at the, uh, the at the North Pole. Right, hexagonal. Like, I mean, it's actually like purpose. Pop, pop, pop. Yeah. yeah, it's like. It's got the dimensions. Cut out in that shape. Oh yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's odd. Yeah. It's really really odd. It's yeah. Um, but yeah, they've they've been able to observe aurora borealis at the north at the North Pole in on Saturn at the very least. Wow. As well, which is quite interesting. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. But that's, yeah, but I thought that was quite an interesting because it was when I was looking into all this like kind of inner Earth stuff and the various cities and stuff, and that was just a. Kind of a little paragraph at the bottom mm. of one of the articles, and I thought, well, that's interesting. So, I, yeah, so I thought I'd bring it to the populace as yeah, a bit of a throwaway I comment. Like that. That's cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, did you want me to jump into the other bits, or have you got something to follow um, on from that? No, or? I'll tell you what, I reckon because I've got the if you go, in, could you go into Hyperborea? Because I've got something. Yeah. Well, I could go into this actually. I tell you what, let me go into this first, and then yeah, go well, on I've to got the Hyperborea after the this. Hyperborea and a few of the other possibly well-known uh, sort of cities that are believed to actually exist. Yeah, and I've even got like locations and stuff, but they're more kind Sweet. of religious, if you okay. like. So I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of follows yeah. on from what I'm saying, but I know you've got a couple of other bits to. Yeah, I've got. Um, of- yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll go through this. Is the story of Olaf Jensen. Okay. Um, and it was published in 1908, and it is actually it's presented as a true account of mm. Olaf Jansson, right. um, a Norwegian sailor who, along with his son, discovered the northern entrance to the Earth's um, interior. Right. Now, they allegedly lived inside this unimaginably gigantic caverns deep inside the Earth for two years as guests to a very tall European-looking inhabitants of the underground network of subterranean colonies or cities. Right. So, again, this is uh, they're going on the idea that it's all connected within yeah. the Earth's surface. You could travel from one city to yeah. another. So, it's not just a land mm. that's within the, within the, the Earth, but... There's different yeah. places you can go across there. Um, now, the original inhabitants are said to be the well, the the capital of this inner Earth city. Um, is said to have been the original Garden of Eden. Right. This okay. is what he's claiming, and cool. had everything that you could imagine from a place that regarded as a biblical paradise. Right. Um, a beautiful. Uh, protected oasis deep under the crust with flowing rivers full of oxygen producing algae like we previously discussed Uh, plenty of fruit trees and a soft diffused glow from lights uh, of light from bioluminescent vegetation and mushrooms that kept in the massive caverns perpetual perpetually lit right so cool this idea that there was no sunrise sunset it's all just a nice soft glow so it doesn't matter does it exactly. so going back to that thing about having to like till the time and the time of day and stuff you yeah. probably didn't need to so the, again this is the idea that there's a northern entrance to the inner earth mm. potentially at the north pole yeah and i know that you looked into hyperborea which is set to be did. Set to around be the north in that, pole in that area yeah definitely yeah so that's yeah. that's that was something that i just wanted to add into there and the yeah. story of olaf jensen you can find it online um it's quite it's, it's a good read it's a good read actually is it um, just a is it a book or is it just like an account a couple of pages of, oh right okay yeah, yeah it's I'll like, a, it out, like yeah. a short story sort of thing yeah. um i believe there's like three or four parts to it um, oh, okay cool so it's not it's not yeah. huge or anything like that I'll but give it a check yeah, yeah it's I'm worthwhile having, yeah. having a, a read of it and seeing the details it comes up and he's um, that account is one in thousands that potentially yeah. I could, oh, could go on about over and over that's and over the thing yet to get to a point where it was like no that's enough to make the point now we've got to stop because otherwise you could just go on and on yeah. and on and well, like, I mean, to be honest, making the point and it's like alright we get it <laughs> there's so much about inner earth mm. theory that 
potentially we could do another episode along along the lines. Oh, really? Quite. I mean, quite easily. Like this could be one of like three parts. Oh, I yeah. think just from what I've found on the actual caves and the inner workings mm. and how they're connected, what they're connected to. This could even be like a bit of a almost like a bit of a conspiracy sort of episode that we could, could do, yeah. which we could if they're interested. Yeah, we did Double mention with, it, didn't uh, we? Yeah, not another, another, guys. Yeah. yeah, not another conspiracy <laughs> podcast, did guys. The, uh, the uh, Hollow Earth. Um, no, they, well, they did. Well, Flat the Earth, didn't flat they? Earth, sorry. Yeah, Flat they Earth. Did they did the Flat Earth um, sort of aspect, and that took them to regions and parts of the world that the inner Earth theory takes you. So mm. there could be quite a cool opportunity to. I think that this is far more plausible than Flat Earth. For oh, sure. Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. For but, sure. Um, oh, absolutely. But this, um, yeah, this kind of, yeah, sort of crosses a few paths with those guys. So that'd be quite, um, yeah, that'd be quite uh, interesting. Mm. Yeah, this could quite easily be a two or three part if we investigate you know other you know elements that we've you know found well, even by just going through the, the caves and the mountain ranges themselves and how they all connect and oh, the honeycomb of systems you know because there are continents and cities well the thing is I know that, that are believed I know JJ will like what we've got coming up yeah in the re- for the yeah, rest of this yeah, episode JJ will for sure because yeah. we are going to we will mention Admiral Bird. We will indeed. Yeah, um, we can't not really. But we won't. We won't mention too much of his stuff from Antarctica. Not too much, no. But no because, well, th- those guys done it brilliantly anyway. Mm. So there was no. There's no need for us to kind of regurgitate it. But I have to mention some of it, just so it's all sort of within context. But yeah, you know, I don't yeah. deep dive to the extent that they oh, did, okay. um, because they've already done it. So go and check out that episode. Yeah, if, they, uh, they, if what I'm about to go into. Go picture interest yeah. but um, I thought I'd start just going off of the Shreffen land and uh, you know the uh, the uh, cave in Ireland that the name I've already forgotten um, <laughs> but what was it called Raf Coggan that was it <laughs> I was about to say the devil's hole but <laughs> or, or that yeah that would have been aptly named yeah it was Rag the Rock well. wasn't it yes okay. <laughs> that's the devil's arsehole um, this is uh, another uh, sort of location that I think in terms of like the, the general populace, is probably believed to be just a you know a, a mythical kind of land or, or place. Um, but if you you know read what you believe and you go mm-hmm. down the right rabbit holes, there, there is a lot of evidence to suggest otherwise. But um, just to throw it out there, Cover Shambhala, it. Shambhala, yes. Um, which if you're a gamer like myself, pops up in Tomb Raider and Uncharted and all the others. So there's probably people out there that are probably quite well versed in uh, in this anyway but um, for those that don't know in Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition Shambhala is a spiritual kingdom um, the Sanskrit name is supposedly taken from a few Hindu references um, one being Shambhal which is a city located in the um, Uttar Pradesh district of India apologies for any butchering of the pronunciation but yep. uh, Uttar Pradesh district um, the other is uh, uh, Shambhalpur uh, which is one of the largest cities in the state of Odish India mm-hmm. um, so they believe that the name has sort of been taken from both of those kind of reference points okay, and job. then kind of put together almost um, excuse me um, people believe that Shambhala was the influence behind uh, Shangri-La which for the most part I think is mythical. Right, okay. But um, Shambhala, not so much. So, yeah, so Shangri-La follows on the same sort of idea, the, the land path. of milk and honey, that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, the more fantastical side of of these spiritual kingdoms, I guess. Um, but someone's basically taken Shambhala and exaggerated it. I suppose it's like the idea of like the, the idea that um, New York was the city paved of gold. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, basically that type of thing. Yeah. yeah, it was a way of kind of creating a more fantastical idea of this place, so more people kind of got on board with it, I guess. Mm. Which is how you then got Raf Coggan in Ireland, and you know you got um, Schlereffen the land of opportunity in, in Germany and, and such. And, yeah, so yeah, okay, yeah so on. they believe that Shambhala was a direct influence to um, to Shangri La. Um, in terms of its size, it's uh, it's believed that um, Shambhala is two hundred and forty five. Yoyanas, Yoyanas, which is a, f- a form of measurement, apparently. Right. Um, 
in India, I think. I'm guessing it's like, yeah, Hindu. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah, no, I've even written here, dickhead. Um, which is an Indian <laughs> form of measurement. Well, yeah, yeah, Jesus Christ. Ready, it, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's an Indian form of measurement. Right. Um, in kilometres, uh, it's about 80, uh, sorry, 2,940 kilometres um, or 1,800 miles. Wow. So it's yeah, it's basically for, for context. It's uh, the northern part of India is just over uh, eighteen hundred miles wide. So it's believed yeah. that Shambhala alone is, e- is more or less equal to the size of northern India, wow. which is the second largest continent by population. Is it or country by population? Some of that I don't. Know. I've read that. And is it? Like, I think so. Right. I've read, I, know I've read China, it right. I know China's way up there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure by population. Oh, uh, density. It's, yeah, it's oh, the okay. second. Gotcha. Like, so just, yeah, just to help with the context, if that's helped at all. Apologies if not. Um, now, th- so that's a kind of a, a, a very sort of condensed idea of what, you know, mm-hmm. Shambhala is. Um, in the late 19th century, um, Helena Blavatsky, yes. uh, who was the head of the Theosophical Society, mm-hmm. basically a religious faction, alluded to the existence of Shambhala um, herself. She claimed to be in contact with a member of the Great White Lodge, um, which is believed to be a group of higher beings. Um, now, this is linked to, quite heavily linked to the teachings of uh, one Alistair Crowley, mm-hmm. um, and also it popped up in the secret cipher of the Euphonauts. It did. Yeah, um, I'm still reading. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, so yeah, so again, it, it harkens back to a lot of what we found in uh, the Hellier um, mm, episodes that we did before about um, occult societies and yeah. esoteric authors and, and such. They, which is basically they, what they are. Bought into it, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they very much do believe that there is something there, something there. For it, well, so. not only that, but that some of them have been there. Mm. To be honest, that some of them have been in contact with higher beings that have come from, um, come from mm. inner earth. I know basically, Lavasky, her her story is interesting. Really is very, interesting. very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Implore anyone to go and read it. For example, I, I could sit here and especially with the, the way whole she, account, she started up the Theosophical Society. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah. And that is still something <laughs> that's still going today. It is. Yeah. Um, and it's still within a lot of um, occult circles. And yeah, it uh, is. I know I keep saying the word occult. What I've got to remember is that occult really does mean hidden. Yeah. That's all that that means. It's, it's yeah. not like, I know it says the word cult in it, yeah. but it's not like Jim Jones and drinking the, the Kool-Aid. It's, <laughs> it's, yes. It's about hidden knowledge and yeah. um, the, the 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 inner alchemy. Yeah. So the idea that your your body is a vessel for a yeah, spirit for that then else. eventually, yeah. through an alchemical sense, transcends. Yeah. So basically, that's pretty yeah. much what she's that's what she's she going down. Stu- yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Um, now. Um, yeah, so yeah, so Alistair uh, Crowley in his teachings and also the Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts obviously came up quite heavily in our uh, Hellia um, sort of deep dive uh, and also the, the Hellia documentary, which people should still go and watch if, if you have it because it is nuts. It's really good. Um, so that's one uh, kind of reference uh, to it. Um, but in the period of 1924 to 1928, two explorers, uh, who actually I think are a couple, embarks on an expedition. Uh, to find Shambhala. They believed it was located in the um, Baluka Mountains in Russia. Um, this uh, was the... And so, yes, yeah, so that was the entrance among three peaks of the Altai Mountains. Mm. The Altai Mountain Range is a region where Central and Eastern Asia, Russia, China, and Mongolia basically all converge at one point. Mm. Um, now... Um, uh, Balk in Balk, I don't know how you pronounce it. Yeah, Balk, uh, yeah. Balk in Afghanistan um, is another believed location of the entrance uh, due to his due to its historical and religious significance. Yes, that does uh, make sense, and that, and that pops up. Afghanistan pops up a lot mm. in a lot of this stuff, religious or otherwise. Mm. So it's quite the well, you know quite what? a hub for it. I'm glad you brought so that was up it, actually was it because oil that they were after when yeah. they went there, or was it absolutely the because stuff, I or? came across um, a story from um, Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, bless her. Good lover. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> love she's her. great. She's awesome. I, uh, I think she's brilliant. She's brilliant. I think unfortunately she's been taken for a ride in a lot of cases. 
I really yeah, do. I think so, yeah. Um, but I think she's absolutely brilliant and her heart and her mind is in the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Like, very endearing. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah and she's, she's and she was telling the story about how she got in contact with some um, US Special Force operatives. Yeah. Um, or should I say ex, like mm. veterans. Yeah, yeah. And um, they had battled um, a, what, giants, basically, mm. in a few different caves within Afghanistan. Well, I think we might have inadvertently covered one of them in the giants episode. I think, yeah. Do you remember when I said that there was a, a group of, a, a, very much that, a group yeah. of soldiers patrolling through? Well, she um, came, I saw it on, the, you know, when, you, when you're scrolling yeah. through Facebook and stuff, yeah. Linda Martin how video. comes on, I've yeah. got to watch it. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and she started talking about it yeah. as well, and I, I, I won't be able to find it again now, but yeah. she was detailing the same story that, yeah, that, yeah. You, that you found as well. Um, Difference is she actually spoke to the veterans that were involved supposedly I just read the article supposedly so, yeah. this supposedly because it's all about a lot of it is anecdotal yeah. they can't bring out any sort locations of and locations and exact details or yeah. any photographs or anything any yeah. solid evidence yeah. that which is an interesting I'll, I'll get onto that yeah, I'll get yeah. onto that later yeah, yeah. the whole idea of there being solid evidence for stuff yeah yeah um, but yeah yeah, yeah. Go, yeah go, go ahead but, and um, continue but yeah so yeah so getting back onto the uh, Shambhala stuff one of the most um heavily believed locations is Tibet in the Himalayas so much so that the Nazis left on a number of expeditions between 1930 mm -hmm. and 1939 um, now this was under the direct instruction of that Heinrich was, Himmler and Rudolf Hess that was those were the ones that um, were detailed by the West yes. and it's since come out that they were going a lot earlier than that so, oh, wow. so before okay. the the um, the Nazis really got into power, they were already sending out. So this is what I found. So the rumours emerged that the secrets had um, of of Agatha in particular Agatha, yeah. was the uh, one that the Tibetans uh, yeah. really do believe in. Which kind of like the holy was, grail of spiritual kingdoms, oh, yeah. isn't it? This Agatha. This is what kind of everyone was kind of looking for, but seemingly found. Mm. other entrances or other cities or yeah. other and, evidence. And Tibet in itself was a very, very secretive country or very secretive mm. culture. But outside as well, they allowed in. No, well, they, they, were, they didn't the allow the Nazis the first... They were. First... Um, I don't know if it was the Dalai Lama, but didn't Hitler or someone high up in the Nazis actually have a, a meeting with the Dalai a Tibetan Lama. Yeah. monk? It might have been the Dalai Lama and he gave them express permission to mm. go and do whatever it is they Absolutely, wanted to do. Absolutely, because what it was down to was the... Um, the, the it was down to the philosophy that they both believed in. Mm. So there was also the use of um, the swastika, yeah. which they both used, the Tibetans and the, the, the Nazis. Yeah. And so <sighs> taking out what happened within the Second World War, the Nazis mm. used the symbol correctly for what they believed in correctly philosophically. Correctly in terms of what they were trying to achieve and mm. what, their belief system was kind of based around. Yeah, so they used it. For there's the a lot right of reasons in terms of, of misconceptions with regards to like the the super race and and stuff like this. There's mm. a, a lot of misconceptions about yeah. it. So the idea of like the Aryans, mm. um, the Aryans referred to a cosmological age. Yeah. Because um, right now we're in the cosmological age of Pisces. Yeah. And the age before that was Aries. And yeah. Aries. So. Aryan referred to the people of Aries yeah. rather than it being a race of people yeah. but was just a people that existed yeah. so it wasn't Within just necessarily time, about yeah. the tall blonde haired blue eyed people it yeah. was about the people that actually existed within that time. So yeah. potentially there could have been um, like darker skinned people, there yeah. were brown eyed people that were also referred to as Aryan. As Aryan, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of there's common misconceptions just, uh, about yeah, that. Superior you know? race type thing, yeah. But yeah, so they were, they <clears throat> met, there was as many um, expeditions for, to Tibet from 1926 yeah. up to as far as 42. Yeah, that, so they that were, makes sense because the Nazis adopted the swastika in 1920. Mm. So for them to then be going to that part of the world only five, six years later, yeah, does kind of 
yeah. stack up, I guess, that there had already been that communication, you know, sort of between them. But yeah, maybe it was only until the 30s that we, that the rest of us kind of caught wind of it and, you know, sort of caught up with what they were doing. Mm. Well, um, apparently the, the reason for these particular journeys, these, these expeditions into Tibet was mm. to document discoveries of fossils of giants yeah. that had been found by the Tibetans. Yeah, Hillary believed. He, yeah. He was like... A cryptozoologist, really. He was really kind into. Of. He was really into a lot of it, and a lot, among other things, such as like the ancestral heritage, uh, such as that. There was um, oh, what do they call it? It's an ancestral heritage think tank. That's the word. Think right. tank. That's called the Ananurbe. Okay, um, and they were searching for communication links between Tibet and Agartha, because right, okay, Ananurbe yeah. very much believed. In Agartha, and they believed yeah. that Tibet was the place was the in which you needed to, to go yeah, to yeah. get there. Um, yeah, that's basically it in a lot of pop culture, isn't it? As well, yeah. That Tibet is the the, the way to the, way, the place to aim for. Absolutely, sort of thing, yeah. and this is the thing. Like they, what they were trying to find was they were trying to find what they called true supermen. Now, mm. I know what I just said almost contradicts what I've just said, but when the talk about like true supermen is said to be men that harnessed and mastered the power of the uni- like mm. universal power that the Germans called Vril mm. um, but it's also known as Chi, Ki, Prana uh, uh, Qigong mm. and Ether as well by, it's called Ether by alchemicalists, yeah. so like Helena Blav- Blavatsky yeah. um, even Alistair Crowley, they would have called it Ether so right. um, anyone that's a Star Wars fan would call it the Force yeah it's yeah. a natural thing that exists around us that that someone can harbour and you can yeah, touch, manipulate. You know, and, as yeah. long as you find the ability to do yeah. it. Um, yeah, yeah, because there is a belief in in the existence of, of that as well. And yeah, that's very much what they were kind of looking for. And I think it was more of the because the, the next thing I was going to go on to is that the the inhabitants of Shambhala are believed to be highly enlightened um, sort of beings. So when you say like superhumans or whatever that's probably more what he was they're looking mm. for these these highly enlightened super beings that can harness this energy and Ones more that, spiritual more gone connected to the, next to the step. earth and they've yeah. gone they're gonna tear up from what we are yeah. now he wanted to look for them to find out how to do it mm. <laughs> basically um and yeah it's also obviously of course a buddhist pure land which is why no one was allowed into you know to bet at mm. all really I think even to this day I think it's pretty tricky to get yeah, to certain well, parts of it I think well, I think China's done mm. a few bits over there and yeah. they've um, they've no done doubt. they've done their part the Han dynasty of China yeah. has done their bit yeah, exactly. that's for sure um, so Buddhist monks believe the location of Shambhala is uh, located on Mount Meru in the Himalayas um, basically the, the mystical north pole of earth mm. Um, although they also believe that it's it, it takes you there, but Shambhala isn't on our sort of planet. It's believed to exist on the astral plane. Mm. Um, so you've got the North Pole as physically a pole in the snow. <laughs> yeah, you know the electromagnetic North Pole, yeah. and, and whereas this is a spiritual or mystical North Pole, and it's located on this Mount Miru in the Himalayas. Well, it makes that's sense where they actually would pinpoint I guess that's what could be the, you know the highest sort of energy or well there's definitely an energy grid across the planet yeah. and a lot of these various different stone monuments in mm. particular are on these lines on those locations yeah um, we even discussed straight lines in Helia again we do, yeah. the idea and that it, locations are linked again in a minute yeah. oh really it okay does. good Good. It does. It comes up, yeah, quite prominently actually. Um, oh, I'll let you continue in, then. In something. I, I mean, I'll have to jump through my notes because I've done this all a bit out of order. But um, okay, no worries, man. And you're, out of, you're out of order. You're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think again, just kind of ch- chiming off of what you said, um, you know, earlier, Native Americans believe that their ancestors uh, came out of the earth. Mm. Uh, Cherokee Indians speak of a subterranean world. Uh, much like our own with rivers, mountains, trees, and of course, people. Um, Central Asia and India um, are almost entirely, I say, covered with tunnels and cave systems, obviously beneath their surface. Um, Some kind of known entrances in terms of caves that have been found Mm. are in Afghanistan, uh, Canada, Arkansas, uh, California, 
uh, which is the Crystal Cave. Yep. Um, Malta, um, the Dolce in New Mexico. Yep. Um, Mount Lesson, uh, or La- sorry, Mount Lesson, California. The Brown Mountains in North Carolina, which is uh, we'll see. Hellier again. Of course, yep. Hellier. Mentioned we'll briefly in, in that. there. There's some weird happenings around there, that's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Um, North Carolina, uh, Brazil, mm-hmm. Mount Shasta, California. Uh-huh. Which, yeah, that came uh, up. Yeah, which came up. Uh, Mongolia, India, Tibet, Arizona, Turkey. And the one that surprised me was Glastonbury, England. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, It's in Welsh. I think it's something like Anwin. Um, is the is the name of it? I think. Oh, okay. It's like it's A double N so the, the, W was N cave something called, or other. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's called. It's either the place in Glastonbury or the mount. The, the cave itself is called Anwin. It's, yeah. it's uh, obviously given Welsh uh, Welsh name, and that's believed to be uh, an entrance to uh, that's cool. in, sort of inner earth. So. Glastonbury road trip. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, exactly. Pack One of the only time I actually want to go to Glastonbury. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you're right. Um, <laughs> now, aside from you know those, there are more kind of notable um, uh, entrances, which are the ones that are kind of pinpointed on most most of the maps that you'll find if you search for an inner Earth map. Yeah. These are the ones that you'll see kind of noted around the uh, edge. Um, but you've got Mount Epimeo in Italy. Um, the Pyramids of Giza, mm-hmm. North and South Pole, the Mammoth Cave System um, in Kentucky are the, the sort of the main ones that I could pick out from the um, the sort of the map yeah. um, that uh, that was thrown up. Um, and also, as we mentioned earlier, um, he is also in the um, Book of Enoch. Uh, he was told of the middle of earth by an angel um, and that it's a blessed land and that there are um, vast cavities with mighty waters um, oh okay that run but I just what, wonder man, whether the middle we're, of we're uh, going to have to do a book of Enoch episode oh yeah without doubt yeah we're going to have to do that I'm going to have to get far smarter and uh, actually read it all first. But yeah, at some point, <laughs> yeah. a couple of years down the line, yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, maybe do a course in anthropology and then get back to it. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah you know absolutely. I mean? Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I just wonder, like reading all this and then, you know, you read things like that, that, you know, that he was told of the middle of earth. Mm. Middle Earth, yeah. Is there some Middle sort Earth, of Earth? Yeah, yeah. Just sort well, of, yeah, absolutely. But this is, is there a, a kind of you know. Well, I know Tolkien often he, he got a lot of his inspiration from the Scandinavian legends as well, and yes. the Scandinavians referred to the land that they lived in as Midgard or Middle Earth, yeah, as well. Yeah. Well, um, he was also given access to um, literature and documents in Finland. In the well, in in, in Oxford, uh, that as well, as well, which is literature that isn't allowed to be seen by the general mm. sort of populace which I think pretty much confirms the history of Europe yeah um, which is where he got a lot of his well, influence he spent, from he spent a lot of time in Finland mm. as well and um, I, I know I mentioned this before on a previous episode the, the elven language is a yeah. mixture of Welsh and and Finnish yeah um, so he was also a, and a linguist yeah. as well so he wasn't just like a, an author he was a scholar mm. a linguist he he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was a clever chap. Mm. The old and he boy. says there's yeah. no... He always maintained there's no symbology in this. There's no allegory yeah, or anything right. like that. <laughs> yeah. He said, this is just me telling a story. Just, so, yeah, just happenstance okay. that it... You, yeah, okay. All right. All right. I'll choose to not believe you on that one. Sure thing. Oh, boy. The greatest respect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all right, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, just to... Um, kind of keep on the same sort of path no no pun intended um, but you mentioned the sort of the straight lines yeah and, the uh, lane lines is what yes. they, they call them isn't it um, this is more so to do with um, sort of navigation but there is a uh, what is known as a, a Mercator projection mm. um, now this is a basically a cylindrical map projection that was presented by a, a Flemish uh, geographer Gerardus Mercato Mm-hmm. Mercato, however you want to say it. Mercato. Mercato. Mercator. Mercator. 
All that, yeah. Yeah, Mercator. In, uh, in 1569. That was interesting that it <laughs> you was... You got me going with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I said it right the first time, and then you I did, fluffed you it did. up the second. Yeah. Um, it, just to start off, I think initially, that I, it was interesting that he, he was claiming to have only have presented it. Mm. So he's like, where did he get it from? Yeah. But anyway, um, it, beca- it it's, it's essentially become the standard map projection for navigation, um, as it basically showed everything that was up as north and everything that was down was south. Yeah. By literally two straight lines. Um, now, when first released, one of the main contentious points um, against what kind of navigators and sailors predominantly were using at the time um, was that it used geographical directions instead of magnetic hmm. so basically if you wanted to go north you just you sailed upwards yeah you know and if you wanted to go south you sailed downwards whereas at the time they were using magnetic uh, navigation i.e compasses to yeah, so okay. navigate basically and when you when and I'm sure you've found this but you know when you read a lot of the theories as, as to where you know the entrances to inner earth are and these other you know kind of geographical locations they they pretty much all document the fact that they had to just kind of follow their nose that they basically just went in a straight line so if they thought they oh, were they, facing north yeah that they just went north and this is where they oh, then found oddly these- enough they often say things like I was guided by God or something like that like they, they yeah. often have an experience of being guided in some way almost yeah. like they didn't really have control over 100% control over yeah. exactly what it is that they were doing exactly that they knew what they were yeah. doing but they, they the idea yeah. of it all came like they knew they had to head in a direction and that they knew that it felt right that, that it felt right that they were going that mm. way but they wasn't necessarily convinced that it was north they were going in but all their because all their instruments were going haywire and, gotcha, and, yeah. and everything else it, it, it comes up quite a bit in um the Admiral Bird um, account, which also I'll come on to. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was the contentious point. They were using basically magnetic compasses to navigate north, south, east, and west. But this theory that was offered up um, was basically just using geographical directions. Right. Okay. So if you go right, you go in east, and if you go left, you know, and that kind of yeah, thing. You go gotcha. up, you go in north. You know, far more simplistic, I guess. Um, and. Yeah, so that was the main contentious point, which is what any. It, it was basically ahead of its time. This this map proje- uh, projection because it actually took two centuries before it was adopted mm. and implemented into kind of general sailing and you know navigation. Um, and uh, so, due to its use of straight lines for essentially what is a more simpler kind of form of navigation. Uh, it is obviously for great travel, and so it, it basically distorts the countries and the continents that are closest to those lines. Mm. So basically, everything that's closest to the equator um, is smaller. Yeah, and then the further you get away from the lines, the land mass increases. Right. Gotcha. So things on the on the map will look far bigger. Than what they actually are. Yeah. So if you get a map, a flat map of today, and oh, you yeah. look at the landmass of Antarctica, it's probably three thirds larger on the map than what it is actually well, the in maps, existence. Well, maps are, are they're, they're distorted. We know a lot anyway. Yeah. They're, we know they're, they're distorted they, anyway. The maps that they get that they print today have mm. a well, it's more than half of it is dedicated to the northern hemisphere. Yeah basically mm. so the equator you would usually say would be halfway up to the map that's displayed yeah, there that's it's the, actually probably two thirds down that's the idea yeah, yeah and, that's what, and that's what this original map was basically showing that the equator was slap bang in the middle then he had two lines either side of it mm. he was basically saying that's north that's south yeah figure out the rest yourself sort of thing uh, which is obviously far you know far simpler and I think that's what a lot of people kind of didn't like because it wasn't using these particular um, instruments yeah as as in, you know, sort of intended. Um, now, um, yeah, interestingly, it's slowly been replaced by other versions, uh, although these aren't any less accurate. So the ones that we're using today aren't any better than this map projection. Right. It's just a different way of um, displaying it, I guess. So, I mean, up until about four years ago, Google Maps, uh, Bing Maps, and, mm-hmm. and whatever else actually used the Mercator projection. Right, okay. Uh, it's only when they brought in Google Earth that they stopped using it. Because gotcha. then when you kind of zoomed in, 
you could tell it was all kind of distorted if they used the same formula. Mm -hmm. And then I think I think they said when they actually then done street view or something, there was an element of that that meant they couldn't use that projection, so they had to go to a different right. format, so, which kind of worked for the technology. This Mercator, then he was, like you say, he was ahead of his time in with regards to the cartography that he was producing. He was yeah. well, yeah. I mean, this is the thing. It only says that he presented it. Which to me suggests that he Sorry, was yeah, that he was given it. producing it. But either, is... but either way, it was ahead of its time because it took two centuries mm. before before we started using it because there was such a kind of uproar about it yeah. that people didn't believe in it. People, you know, and it, it was a, it was contentious in the fact that the way he was sort of saying. Well, this is simply how you use it. People are like, nah, it can't be that. Yeah, you know, I've yeah, got exactly, a compass yeah. that tells me north that way, and you know, so people were just kind of dismissive of it. You know, without without um, really giving, giving it, it a go. chance, really. Yeah. Which, yeah, it's human nature. You Absolutely. Um, and he also said, you know, he produced mm. um, another map because he was a he was a cartographer. He was a geographer as well. Yeah. He had the uh, the ancient Arctic map as well, didn't they? He did. Yeah, now that's an interesting one. That is a very interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to, have you got anything? On I, that? I, I, I didn't, only because we weren't going into the Arctic and that too specifically. So yeah. I kind of left it out deliberately. But okay, but yeah, but yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just go a little you, bit about it because what, yeah. the, the the ancient Arctic map itself um, details the land of Hyperborea. Yeah. Now the, the, we've we've spoken about the idea that the entrance to inner earth is at the north the hyperborea is said to be at the north pole um that it's it's, it's hidden it's said it's yeah. hidden underneath what is now sea level um with it being 400 meters higher than what it was say ten thousand years ago yeah exactly um yeah. but the what it what it constitutes of. I mean, you guys can go and look at it. You can look yeah. at either ancient Arctic map or Mercator's map, and you'll certainly yeah. come across exactly what it is that we're talking I about. I think it's more prominent on his on the more Mercator uh, map. It's the in same terms thing. Of, yeah, yeah. But yeah. See, it seems more prominent on that map as opposed to when they break it down into the Arctic oh, okay. one. Yeah, okay. from Butcher. what I saw. Yeah, but I didn't make any specific notes. Well, um, what it what it details basically is it's four rivers. Throw, uh, flowing into the centre of the this center of land map, mass, yeah. which is said to be um, the North Pole. Yeah. Now, what they also say is they actually show that the rivers flow into the Earth. Yes. Now, that's what this this particular map that's details. It flows into the centre of it. Yeah. So, what old cultures, ancient cultures, have, have suggested is that the entrance to inner Earth is at the North Pole. Mm. Mercator's map suggests that there is. An entrance, an entrance to something there, there. yeah. Um, and then Admiral Byrd had a, a, an increased, in very, very interesting flight over the North Pole. He did as yeah. well. He did. Um, but just to, because I've got, a, I have got all of that Piper stuff. But just to finish oh, off okay. on the um, Mercator map, so we know that it was it was uh, adopted, you know, two centuries down the line because a lot of the contentious elements, you know, to it. Um, but another possible reason, you know. That I found, which you've, which you've just, you know, sort of rightly pointed out, is that um, it's a map of obviously the the poles in a, in and or sort of the North Pole, and the rivers that flow into it, as you say, are in the subtle shape of the swastika. Mm. And that so was an I, interesting thing that yeah that I I almost had like a little bit of a light bulb moment over the Christmas period because I do I I watch a lot yeah. of things about yeah. these ancient cultures and, and such and Hyperborea came up and it was uh, it was a video about um, the the use of the swastika which mm. is. There's a common misconception with that. Swastika is actually a, a Sanskrit word. It's well, the, not the, German the have at all. It. Oh, absolutely. Basically. But yeah, it, it means yeah. well-being. So again, I've made a note of that as well. So, so it, it seems to kind of go down the more academic route to say it took so long to be implemented because of the because of how it kind of went against the form of navigation that they were using at the time, which was using magnetic compasses as opposed yeah, so. to just geographical locations. Again, up was north, down was south. Mm. But I seem to, but by reading through sort of other stuff, I know we spoke briefly about it yesterday, but I think a possible reason that it's slowly being kind of replaced and, and almost like shunned is because of this subtle shape that the rivers make mm. of the, the swastika. And obviously, if they were able to just kind of rely on what 
its true purpose was and kind of where it came from, then it probably wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. But because of the Nazis... Well, it's, well the thing is, it's, it's had, that symbol's had many names over the years. I mean, I, I said to oh, you last night, like, really, ideally, I'd prefer to refer to it as the Tetraskelion. Yeah. Really, because that's the, that's that's the Greek of, word and yeah. swastika is actually the older form of that word, yeah, yeah. Of, of that symbol. But it's a symbol that's been used for thousands of years. It's yeah. not... Yeah, and as you rightly say, uh, swastika is uh, an Indian Sanskrit word yeah. meaning well-being. Yeah. So it gives you an idea as to what its um, intended use uh, is. And, and this is, and it's been used by Hindus and Buddhists, amongst others, literally for millennia. Oh yeah. So long, it, long before. Mate, there, there are there are a Christian um, temples in Ethiopia. Mm. Um, that are dug out of the rock. They're, they're carved out of the, yeah. the bedrock into the ground. Mm. And they've got swastikas, they've got stars yeah. of David on them, yeah. they've got the, the crucifix cross. Well, I mean, you found the, the, case, the swastika and the star of David, which yeah. is often called the Seal of Solomon, are often portrayed right next to each other or overlapping each other. Yeah. So this is something that, if guys, if you, would, if you do want to learn more about it, then go and find it because yeah. you're not going to be told by any sort of history class no. or it's certainly not the mainstream media, but you need to go out there and, and actually yeah. look for this stuff because yeah. otherwise there's huge misconceptions about this particular symbol. Yeah, exactly. And just to sort of end on that, that it, it was it was only adopted by the Nazis in 1920, as, as I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, and it was then changed to a symbol of brutality, fascism, and sadly genocide. But for millenn- After 1945. Yeah, but for millennia yeah. prior to that, it was well-being, peace. Yeah love kindness and, and all that stuff yeah so it was yeah it was just one one person kind of took it and and kind of ruined it and it's forever been kind of tarnished really unless yeah. you know where to look to yeah, kind of find want to make this very very clear as well we're defending the symbol not the acts done in the symbol's no, no, name the symbol the symbol <laughs> and its origins and its intended yeah. meaning and all that all that stuff um but yeah but so just, just to move on because i know we've, we've kind of dropped a few breadcrumbs <laughs> yeah sort of along the way but um Yes, yeah, so, so much like Shambhala, there is another, um, you know, possibly mystical land linked to this inner earth theory. Um, and as we've both previously mentioned, um, that is known as Hyperborea, um, which is mostly Greek law. Um, it is a mystical island uh, in the far north of the earth. So it comes back to, you know, the straight lines. Yeah. It's at the furthest, you know, sort of north. Um, and it's uh, believed to be situated far beyond the north, uh, oh, sorry, the north wind. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was or is a, a paradise where its inhabitants could live for thousands of years. Um, interestingly, <laughs> if you wanted to cut your time short on the uh, Hyperborea, um, then you would dress yourself with garlands and throw yourself off a rock hey? into the water what it's, it's your impending doom apparently if you didn't want to live for thousands of years oh. if you'd had enough oh I gotcha yeah <laughs> you completely lost me there I'm like what <laughs> okay so if you were living the in Hyperborea and you're, Hyperborea. you're done you're like yeah. me time's up they'd live for thousands of years get into a cer- ceremonial if you didn't dress want to. And, yeah take a dive you'd basically strip down wrap some garlands around you jump off a rock and and that'd be your lot um they were, of course, a long-lived race, um, untouched by war, hard toll, and things like old age and disease. Hmm. Didn't have any of that. Hence for living thousands of years. Absolutely, yeah. Um, now, the the land is, is or was bordered to the north by a great ocean um, known as Oceanus, um, which is also the name of a Greek titan, mm-hmm. interestingly, um, which is also... Oh, yeah, I just said that bit. <laughs> uh, on the south, it is bordered by the um, uh, Repaion Mountains, assuming I've pronounced that right. Repaion Mountains. Yeah. Okay. Um, its uh, peaks were inhabited by gold-guarding griffins uh, and its valleys by a fierce tribe of one-eyed men. <laughs> Um, ah, the Cyclops. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, Boreas was a winged god of the wind. Mm-hmm. Um, this you know, great wind was known as the North Wind, um, which is where the island is based. So you've got this great, as north as you can go, you've got this great wind. Mm. And then beyond that, 
is, is Hyperborea. Gotcha. So it's protected by this god, Boreas, the great wind. Mm. And then within that, it's got other sort of titans and gods supposedly uh, uh, protecting it. Um, it is ruled supposedly by three priests of the god Apollo, and they are known as the Bore- Boreades, okay. possibly. Um, and they're the sons of Boreas. Oh, the sons of Boris. So it's all Boris, Boreas, <laughs> jackass. <laughs> so it's all uh, <laughs> locked down. <laughs> go out, no, the other don't go out. Boris. Go to work, don't go to work. <laughs> um, if you could go to work, don't go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, dickhead. Yeah. Um, uh, let's be trying to. Th- uh, Are oh, you right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, so in terms of kind of like real world stuff, there are very early maps that place it north of what is now France, um, but the more modern theories place it among the uh, the Ural Mountains of Russia, uh, specifically on the western coast, which border the Arctic Ocean, mm-hmm. um, which starts to bring us over to kind of where everything everyone else seems to think it is yeah um now it is also you know kind of believed or widely known that uh, admiral bird uh, flew over and saw potentially saw hyperborea when he flew from one pole to the other mm. with i think two or three companions um he was assigned to operation high jump in 1947 um the main objective was to actually go and build an american training and research facility in the north pole um misconception there that high jump was on the south pole and it was an invasion of um, over 8,000 men, aircraft carriers, frigates. It was an invasion of yeah. Antarctica. Yeah. And that was 1946, I believe, Operation High Jump. With the flight over the North Pole, it was just. Um, this, was a his, this was in his flight. account. Right. Done, take, I'm reading this from. So. High Jump on the North. Uh, I'm sure High Jump was in the South right, Pole. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, go on. Carry it's. On. Um, yeah, so he was he was assigned to that operation anyway in, in 1947. That was believed to be the main. Well, it was the main objective that was put out to everyone. To the, to the world. Was a, th- there's conspiracy that there was actually a different um, reason, and that was uh, to actually search for evidence of the rumored German base two one one. That was the that's the actual real reason people believe that he yeah. was sent there, but the. Yeah, the, the idea the kind was, of the um, hush hush was that they were going to build Neuschwabenland was the mm. the yeah. area of, mm. of Antarctica that yeah. they were supposed to be invading. So yeah, so this basically so the base that he was going to kind of scope out and start building and then kind of working on was basically to serve the same purpose um, as the German base that he was actually going to kind of find evidence of and mm-hmm. no doubt probably destroy. Um, uh, da, da, da. How were the only? Yeah, so yeah, so that the, the was basically the he was sent there to build a base that was basically the same purpose as what they believed the Germans had already done before them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the actual reason was that he was supposedly going to go there and destroy it. Um, however, the only difference, um, <laughs> the, the, the only difference really being between the two bases was supposedly anyway was that the Americans was going to be a training and research facility but the Nazis is, is actually a, a lab where they were carrying out experiments mm. um, you can imagine the type of experiments they've done before so it was probably along that same kind of same kind of thing um, we, we also know from you know the previous info that they were also looking for um, Shambhala and that he was obsessed with you know this Aryan race, which I know we discussed a yep. bit earlier, um, and they were, um, yeah, hell bent on finding other, you know, pure races. So these higher beings, these spiritual beings, and they obviously firmly believed that this location was the entrance to, you know, kind of finding that. Because I'm guessing Tibet threw up, you know, nothing that was of interest to you know to, to them from what we, well, yeah. from what we're told at least, mm. um, and what's you know presented to us. Um, now, in his flight, Admiral Byrd reportedly found the entrance to the underground city of um, Agatha, or Agatha. Agatha, yeah. um, He also uh, communicated with the master, who was the city's leader. Um, he basically confirms that they... Um, 
they've not showed any interest in uh, in humans or surface folk, I guess, yep. <laughs> uh, before, but choose to do so um, when we as a race um, launched the first atomic weapons over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, it was that alarming to them that they launched their own aerial craft to investigate the damage that we had caused. Um, these craft were called the uh, Flugel Reds. Um, Apparently, um, we're not supposed to harbour such weaponry and power. And so they took it upon themselves to basically come up and have a word, see how we'd used it. And yeah, basically have a word and say, yeah, don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more or less. Um, now, according to the master, um, there are vast tunnels under Tibet, um, Giza and the North Pole. And it's the one at the North Pole that leads to Agatha. Mm. Um, that was just basically a snapshot of their gotcha. conversation because yeah. oh, see, if I went through their whole conversation yeah, yeah, I'd be sitting here for an hour we ain't got time, <laughs> we ain't got time. <laughs> but no but that was the um, yeah that was kind of a in a nutshell pretty much what they you know sort of discussed um, but as we mentioned earlier there is a transcript of um, you know the flight and exhibition um, online which we've both read um, I'll only go through the interesting bits but there are quite a few of them because he breaks it up in like five or ten minute segments. Right, okay. So there are quite a few. I mean, you'll probably recognise all of this um, anyway. Um, so the flight takes place on the 19th of February, 1947 at 6am. Um, between then and 9.15, um, they basically do all their checks, um, check the fuel, check the clocks, mm -hmm. make sure the compasses are working, uh, the comms are working with the uh, the base camp and they gradually increase altitude obviously there's about four entries into his diary or a log sorry yeah that goes blow for blow for each bit so i didn't want to cover <laughs> no, that no you don't need to go um, through that by 9 55 a.m the aircraft uh, has reached 2950 feet and admiral bird records seeing a mountain range up ahead uh, they consist of a small, a smaller range um, that hasn't been recorded before. It's not coming up on any of their kind of maps or their kind of known uh, sort of locations or areas of interest. Yeah. Uh, five minutes later, they are heading over the mountain in what they believe is a northward direction. They are uncertain as the compass on board is playing up. Mm. Basically, barking back to what we were discussing about the magnetic uh, way of navigating. Um, beyond the mountain range is a valley with a stream running through the middle. Uh, the baffling thing about it is that there shouldn't be a green valley there when you take into account where they are. Yeah. There shouldn't be where any they, green. Well, where they, or where they think, think they are, they are yeah. at the very least. Um, it should all be ice and snow. There shouldn't be any greenery or anything. Uh, to the to the right of, of uh, said uh, stream, um, he notes great forests growing up on the slopes of mountains. Uh, another five minutes pass and the aircraft increase their altitude again to 1,400 feet. They chuck a sharp lift um, to get a better look of the valley. It is uh, green with a type of moss also covering it. He comments on the light being different as he can't see the sun anymore but there is a light emitting from somewhere. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they make another left and Bird notes seeing a large animal below. Now this, I was like, what? Um, he claims it's an elephant, then on further look, uh, basically decides that it's a mammoth. Yep. They drop their altitude to a thousand feet and take a look through binoculars. He confirms that it is a mammoth, although he can't quite believe it. And he radios the sighting back to base camp probably his first mistake <laughs> yep that's his first mistake that's his first one yep um, this lasts about 30 minutes and they encounter more rolling hills the temperature is reading around uh, 23 degrees celsius or 74 fahrenheit mm. for our american friends um Continuing in that direction, the navigation tools um, now start to work um, but the radio doesn't below them to their surprise, again, they see a city. Um, all on board believe that it's impossible and that there shouldn't be a city there. Um, then on their uh, starboard, they spot uh, a strange aircraft. Um, they are uh, disc-shaped and they close in rapidly beside them either side. The disc-shaped aircraft, um, once close enough, um, 
reveal markings on them that Admiral Byrd was able to make note of. Um, and he basically notes that there is a type of swastika mm-hmm. on the side of both uh, of these disc-shaped craft. <clears throat> At uh, 11.35 a.m., the radio, which wasn't working previously, starts to crackle and a voice comes through. It is speaking in English, but with a uh, German accent, and it delivers the following message. Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. Which was a bit like... Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Um, the you didn't in- do the accent, though. I, no, I, I decided against it <laughs> through fear of uh, assaulting yeah. a whole oh, man. nation of peoples. Ah, oh, well. Welcome, Admiral. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> no, yeah, that's why I didn't do it. Yeah. Um, the you engine- should have practised. Yeah, I should have done. Yeah, you should have had more bottle as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, the engines um, on Admiral Bird's plane stop and he is under some um, type of control from the other craft. Within 10 minutes, they have landed, and several men are approaching their craft. But they have no weapons, um, but a voice commands the Admiral to open the cargo doors. Mm. Um, Admiral Bird and one of his crew, um, who I believe is the radio man, uh, are taken off the aircraft and down onto a platform. It's a conveyor belt-like platform, um, because it's not on wheels or anything, so it simply seems to hover. And it takes them quickly towards the city that, that you know they saw from above. They arrive at the city um, and eventually stand before a grand door. It opens and the Admiral is told, have no fear, Admiral. You are to have an audience with the Master. Um, they have a lengthy conversation, which I sort of paraphrased a little bit earlier. Um, and a month later, in March of 1947... Admiral Richard Byrd is dragged into the Pentagon and told to not tell anyone about what happened for the good of mankind. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, so that is a very quick <laughs> um, snapshot of, of kind of his log, but it's quite literally from six in the morning till about, what was it, half 11 yeah. in the morning, which is when he does his official log on board. Excuse me, it's broken up into like five or 10 minute segments. So yeah. it goes through every single blow of all the checks and all the scientific data he they was, recalled. And he was a very trusted and prestigious man. Oh, he was given the so Medal of Honor to suggest this. that he could so make up something like that. It's just quite on wild. the whim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, he was clever out, enough. He was given Operation High Jump for crying out loud. He was clever enough so to make it up. Yeah, in oh, that yeah. respect, and you know, but he was trusted to you know on this you know operation on this mission, whatever you want to call it. Because in a in a flight prior to that, I can't remember when now. Some early in the forties, I think, he was given the Medal of Honor for um, being the first to fly over the South Pole or something in just a mm. normal, in just a motorized plane, I think, or something. Yeah, he was the first he, one. He, yeah, he's done both poles, and that's where he got the Medal of Honor. So he wasn't just any old numpty stuck in a plane. Like <laughs> no. he was, it was a big deal to the American Air Force and to, and to the government. And, and, you know, I think that's shown, um, you know, when only a month later, I mean, I'm surprised it took him a month, but, um, yeah, in March of 1947, he's dragged into the Pentagon and given a very, very stern interview. I think I, I, he gives the exact time. I think it was mm. something like 12 hours or something, nine, nine or 12 hours that he was sort of interviewed by different, you know, sort of people about what he saw and, mm. and he was told under strict instructions, you are not to tell this, you know, to anyone, you know, sort of for the good of mankind. But of course, Word like, any, like any good person, he uh, he did, I think it was pretty much on his deathbed or, yeah. or he knew he was coming to the end and he was like, I'm not taking this to the nah. grave with me. Like I need to, you know, I need to tell people. So again, why would he be dragged into the Pentagon and well, told uh, to not tell to be, about? Well, this is, this is something as well to, to, to add to that. There is yeah. no, um, what do they call it? Sanctioned flights over the North Pole anymore. There aren't. No, they've actually got outposts, aren't they, at certain Mm -hmm. locations, which does kind of tie into the flat earth thing that, um, was it David Weiss? Was that his name? Oh, yeah, yeah. That he went over the NAC. Where, yeah, where the, there's basically outposts, outposts that stop you from points flying that, yeah, will stop you bits. from ex, uh, exploring beyond that point mm. or, you know, flying over that point. You know, you're given instructions on where to sort of land or how far you can go, that, that type of thing. So, you know, and but, there are harsh conditions out there. So if you're stationing 
you know, soldiers mm. to, to stop people on the off chance that they might try and go beyond a certain point. What well, is even is it you're hiding? Well, even then, there's um, even satellite imagery of the North Pole. Um, it's yeah. blacked out. Mm. It's redacted. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, guys, go and check it out. I mean, if there's, if there's a conspiracy, I reckon there is a conspiracy there. Yeah. Because it's especially with regards to what's surrounding Operation High Jump as well. Yeah. So, was the, the, one of the other guys that really came up with the idea was the Defence Secretary at the time, James Forrestal, right. who um, had a bout of melancholy after <laughs> after Operation High Jump came back right. with a hell of a lot less men and a hell of a lot less equipment. Yeah. Um, basically came back defeated. Mm. Um, he took a swan dive out of a 13-storey hotel room. A hospital room, I think it was, or house, right. hospital or a hotel. Um, but yeah. Was it a swan so, dive or a push? Mm, <laughs> who knows? Just, uh, but that was, yeah. that, was the, um, that was the guy that was big involved in Operation mm. High Jump, along yeah. with Admiral Bird as so what well. What the hell did they find? And you know what? What were they? And there's so there's a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on at the poles, guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's very very strange. And it was quite weird actually because I was doing this research, which was very much about the Arctic and the North Pole, and you know, and all this, and you know, inner Earth in, um, entrances and stuff. And on the because I like to have something on in the background just so it's not completely silent. Um, and I had the uh, the, the new uh, Kong vs Godzilla film oh, on with, with Hollow Earth, and it, and I just you know sort of writing away or you know sort of typing away. And one of the main characters like mentions like we've got the we've got the equipment. We want you to go and look for um, inner Earth. Yeah, and I was like. Hang on. What? <laughs> so I kind of I down tools and I was like, oh, I was watching it and I was like, oh shit. And, yeah. and it's, and in, to, like, and it's in Antarctica, and, I believe, that, that, that's yeah. where they go to, to get Kong to and go into the center these, of them and they follow like, him. Craft and yeah, they, they get him to lead them to. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert, yeah. yeah. And I was just like, no way. Like, how's that for synchronicity? Like, and, and I, I don't he think didn't. I'd seen it before. Mm. So I didn't know that that was cropping up. And it just so happened when I was starting the Admiral Bird stuff. Yeah, um, it's, that, it's that, incredible. That, that, that it? came on, and I was like, "That's weird." Man. Well, this is this is the thing as well. Like, we we've we haven't covered nearly half of the stuff that we've found about this. Really, no, just for the interest of time. I mean, for four hours. I mean, we're already overrunning a bit anyway. Is we've it gone is. over what we assumed would it would take? Oh, to, absolutely. To go over it, but I know we've chucked a few extra bits in. And yeah, had so, a bit of a, I mean, sort I of know, a chit chat, but getting off the fence, I know which side that. I'm on mm. and I'm very very sure we're going to do we're going to hit this again at a later date I'm sure it will come up again or we'll deliberately do a um, we we'll definitely another, have to we're going to have to revisit episode. this and, and just go through pretty much everything that we've found so far I mean I've got a load more notes and everything that we could go over but well there's a lot more that I deliberately stopped myself from going into <laughs> yeah <laughs> Because, yeah, just because of, of how this episode kind of went, you know, so I didn't necessarily go down the, the caves, you know, bit and, you know, the sort of the, the power that some of these locations kind of harness and how people try and use it and, mm. you know, other sort of locations around the world, which I know we sort of briefly spoke about yesterday. And, and yeah, there's research that I just stopped myself from, you know, kind of going into on the episode because, yeah, we could be sitting here for over four hours, mm. um, you know, just, just covering what we, you know, sort of found. So yeah, we will definitely need to revisit it, I think, um, and uh, and see, yeah, kind of where we sort of end up. But yeah, I guess to sort of close this one, um, yeah, I um, I would be on the the side of the, you know, the, I think the, it's the, perfectly there is plausible. Some, yeah, it's definitely plausible. Yeah, the so evidence much so- alone, just that we've found, is pointing in, you know, in that you know direction. Mm. You know, you you provided the. You know the science earlier that that sort of proves that life can be sustained. You know, deep underground and without the use the of the darkness. Sun. Yeah, you know, and we've got um, you know accounts from you know pretty respect- respected people mm-hmm. of what they've seen, what they've found, um, and you've got cave systems popping up all you know all over the world. Yeah, um, that as soon as they're found, they're shut off. <laughs> yeah, that as well. And people are stopped from caving and you know going down there. And I mean, even just the idea. I mean, even if you don't necessarily believe that there could be um, breakaway civilizations that live within the Earth, mm. but certainly the idea that the Earth's crust is a honeycomb-like structure mm. that 
is connected yeah. all the way through. Like, I guess, like the, the, the lakes and channels that you have out in Florida. That yeah. you, we know for sure that every single mm. one of them is connected in Florida. So yeah. why would that not also be a possibility with regards to the Earth's crust, the Earth's yeah. surface? I think you know? oceans that connect into rivers and rivers that connect into lakes and lakes connecting to streams and whatever. And, you know, could those connections be because there's a corresponding tunnel mm. underneath? And we know that the, the Earth's crust is miles thick as well. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily know the rest of it. No. 100% sure. I'm sure there's some sort of geologist out there that will prove me wrong. Yeah. But we definitely know that hollow earth yeah. as a as a as a theory mm. is implausible. Yeah. Because it doesn't yeah. just doesn't seem scientifically um, that accurate. Does seem, yeah, it just does seem plausible, as you but say. Inner earth, earth, however, yeah. That, yeah, I can totally get on board with yeah. that. And the idea and of breakaway people, civilizations as well. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of people from long ago, so before there was technologies, before there was science and, mm. and any of that, that, that believed it. You know, religions... It's you know it's steeped in you know religion and different religions as well. So you can't just go after one and be like, oh, they, you know, they're making it up. It's the you know, all religions come from the same it's place. It's the legend of Agatha that gets me. Yeah, it's that legend that gets me. It's like it, that so many people were looking for it, mm. and so many people have the same map, have the same kind of you know drop the pin on the map in terms of where they think it is. Well, the, definitely the thread to to pull on, I think, is that connection between. Uh, National Socialist Germany and, mm, yeah. and the Tibetans. Yeah, that is definitely a thread to That's pull on and, to, and yeah. see what you can unravel from that. Because Break that down. Yeah, definitely. again, with that, I've been I've redacted a lot of the stuff that I've found out <laughs> because I think it's worthwhile you guys going and looking for it yourself. Yeah. Um, because ideally, what we don't want to do, we don't want to upset anyone. We don't upset anyone with what, like we, that. We, with what we bring forward. We don't want to sort of cause any offence or any We also any don't hurt, want that axe so. coming down on their necks either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that with a gun pointed at the back of my head. But uh, no, there's some information that I think we can point you in the direction of and we can kind of allude to, like, you know, we have... You know, very we're very restricted various, on what we can say. Various... Uh, well, I mean, we're not, but... We well, can say what we like, but we're choosing not to, for, you know, through fear of yeah, getting get lynched for it. But well, yeah, exactly. But we, we could say it quite easily, but we could get lynched. Though we get lynched, we could get lynched, <laughs> and so we're thinking better of it. But yeah, we're kind of alluding to it, and I think we've done that earlier with the, mm. you know, the various symbol mm. that's been used, you know, sort of through time. The tetraskelion. Uh, yeah, and that was. Uh, yeah, that was you know purely just to kind of draw some comparisons and some links between various sort of, you know cultures and you know expeditions and stuff. There's you know there's for no other purpose. But um, yeah, it's definitely worth people looking into that a little bit more, and you know and their you know sort of connection and, and how mm. they came to came to be with one another and help each other out seemingly. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, we're going to probably go into this a little bit more, just because there's so much. Oh, there's so rich, much evidence and history and mm. accounts and locations and well, God knows whatever else. And yeah. It's just going to unravel and unravel Mate, and unravel. We're gonna, so. It's going to get very conspiratorial. It's going to get like real sort of conspiracy. Naturally, naturally it will lead into yeah. a lot of that. I think we've been alluding to that over the past couple of episodes anyway. Yeah, like I think worst, so. Yeah, yeah, last ones of, of, of the previous season. Yeah. You know, that there's definitely a cover-up of something. Of something, yeah. Um, I being think we're done getting, by someone or a group of people or whatever. Yeah, and we've, we've been, you know, that took us on one direction. I think, you know, now we're going into, you know, another, you know, direction um, of cover-ups. And, and that's before we even get to, you know, UFOs and <laughs> the government, US government right. and New Mexico and Roswell and yeah. all that government. And that all, time, could, that all that timing is very, all very, is all very convenient similar. Yeah, with exactly. what we've spoken about today as well. Yeah, exactly. That's so, really convenient. Yeah, no doubt when we eventually end up on that subject, we'll end up harkening back to, you know, a lot of this stuff. Mm. Um, you know, just as a little kind of teaser, I guess, you know, yeah. the flying saucers and the aircraft that we see... You know, they're probably not coming from the sky. No, they're not why extraterrestrial. Do think, why, why do you think they're not? They're just they're terrestrial. Ultra terrestrial. Is that that's the term? <laughs> just that terrestrial. They use. Yeah. yeah. Ultra terrestrial. Yeah. So they they they're here. They've yeah. always been here. And um, well, why do you think air, air traffic control never never pick them up? Or why well, they do? You know, craft don't go and they do, but they just keep hush about it. That's the thing. Well, no, but what I mean is like coming through the. Atmosphere, they'd be able to tell from quite oh, a distance yeah, course, that yeah. they're coming through the atmosphere and coming from great distances or whatever, but they only 
maybe and you sort of mention it when they're already maybe here it's sort of the thing. technology that's used this is, is that because they came the from thing. down instead of, instead of from, from from up i yeah. guess <laughs> if that makes sense absolutely but yeah but that's just a, a teaser on what is uh, yet to come i guess oh yeah quite a way down the line one would imagine but definitely uh, but yeah i think um i think that's pretty much i think we kind of done it through the episode but i think that's kind of us yeah, yeah i think we've got off the fence for, there really and we've covered but you know, we'll, thus we'll far, definitely but be uh, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll coming definitely back to go it. back to Naturally, this one guys i think we'll be coming back to it at, in a uh, part two it might not be the next episode but it'll be no, somewhere it down the be line one of them yeah for sure yeah, yeah so so in closing guys thank you very very much yeah, thank you as for, always for listening to our first episode of season two yeah. hope you've enjoyed it we've uh, you know we, we certainly have it's been a different type of yeah. episode sort of for us it's been more sort of conspiratorial I guess as you said earlier mm. it's been you know more conversational than maybe what some of the others have, have sort of possibly been if that makes sense yeah. but um, and certainly the research took us down a path that we uh, you know that we weren't um, you know expecting so um yeah, so thank you for sticking sticking it out. I hope you enjoyed it as uh, you know as much as uh, we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, so yeah, we just want to in closing. So we just want to remind you guys to go and support your favourite podcast. Heading over to Patreon yeah. and having a look Please at those uh, tiers that Callum described earlier. Yeah. Um, also, another huge thank you to Hellfire Studios um, yeah. uh, th- th- as well for for housing us again. Yeah. Um, and, and making don't all forget, this possible, making yeah. it possible, and also yeah. don't forget about going and getting your 20% off with uh, the discount yeah. code cryptid yeah obviously you know while. we're on the socials you know we're on Facebook we're on Instagram we're on Twitter yeah. we're on YouTube as well we are yeah um, we may there's another little uh, project that we've got coming about on YouTube <laughs> that we're think tanking about <laughs> which uh, yeah. I will okay. allude to now but yeah, that okay. is all you're getting yeah okay um, yeah. and also I suppose it we better um, announce the next episode and this is going to be well I, I guess just before, a new one just before that whilst we're on the uh, the, the, the thank you is actually just our current patrons yeah Justin and James just yeah. another thank you to to those guys um, they you know they sort of get involved uh, you know as much as uh, sometimes as much as we do well <laughs> well this next episode on is born the, out of, of uh, out of our Patreons really absolutely that's so, why yeah, um, little segue. Yeah, so yeah. another big thank you specifically to you James because yeah. we're going to uh, finally attempt to answer the questions Your you've question. been putting to us yeah um, the, the big the big one yeah, yeah the big <laughs> big question so yeah. what is the meaning of life yeah 42 he's 42 so thank you and good night thank you and good night <laughs> yeah. no no he's um, he, he's asked many questions over the time of, uh, that he's been listening to us, and uh, and he has, yes. the the question that can really be boiled down to: Have we lost abilities to communicate with other realms of existence? Yeah. Um, that being either the spiritual realm or yeah. a um, a. Uh, a parallel universe that exists yeah. next to Ultra us. Ultra-terrestrials. Ultra-terrestrials these, these and light such. and higher beings that we're, you know, that we're told mm. about. So, yeah, it kind of um, links quite nicely into, you know, sort of what we've just uh, sort of spoken about, really, yeah. you know, in that respect, in terms of, like, the communication and, and can we can we do it? Did we ever he's, do it? He's and put forward some really, really good ideas that... Yeah, good ideas, a couple of good arguments. ...that certainly the, the same question... Yeah, and we will be thinking, looking at all it? of these various different things. So we will be looking at um, stone monuments and their potential yes. um, There's been more than just stone monuments. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> what, what was their intended purpose? I'm really quite excited so, to get into this one in particular. Yeah, I mean, I've, be, I've uh, already... Another good one. The, I'm already going to be sending over a few little bits and pieces over oh, to okay. you to get you on the right, same sort okay. of wavelength. Lovely, okay. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I think it's going to be good because we're going to go away, do our own research and try not to talk no, to each other no. too well, we much. we don't normally. It's only on this one because of my struggles that we had probably a little bit more of a chat than, you know, kind of yeah, what we normally would. But yeah, normally we, we don't. You It'll know, be good to come back to next Thursday time. Thursday before when we have our little planning chat and even then we just kind of go through the timings, the structure and, and that kind of thing. We don't discuss 
kind of no. coming off the fence or you know where our research has taken us because we like to, like it to be a, as much of a sort of surprise to yeah. us, I guess, as uh, you know, as, as you guys. So, so I'm, I mean, I've oversimplified James's question there. But, oh yeah, that was and I will, yeah, somewhat, big time. Yeah. So I'll go through his 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 line of questioning in full, in yeah. full at the beginning of the in next, the next episode. Uh, episode, yeah. So absolutely. But until then, until it's goodbye then. from me. It's goodbye from me. And remember to ask yourself if the old occult adage "as above, so below" is true. Oh. And whether or not it means anything to you now. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> very good. You like that, yeah? I like that. That's yeah. a good one, man. <laughs>